Oh, let's get this fixed. My camera wasn't on. Man, this has been a rough start to today. Uh, what's up, everybody? Today is Friday, August twenty, uh, August 6, 2021. We are Fishing Grits. Uh, if some of y'all were around for that last start, the whole world was conspiring against us. My computer was plotting against me. My microphone didn't was on protest. It was obviously still on vacation. Uh, my internet was supposed to be fixed, but it's not. But hey, here we are again. We should be good to go. Uh, if this is your first time catching this attempt around, uh, we just got back from a little break here. I was on vacation for a week, and then after that I was sick, plus fighting internet problems, and then Mike had to do something. So here we are, off about three days from our normal uh, going live. But we can't miss this because we got a lot of information to cover today. We got a lot of information going on in the sports world. Uh, we got a lot of information just all over the place. But most importantly, Micah, Marco, how have y'all been? How are y'all doing? It's been a while since we've all sat down and talked to one another. I've been itching to talk about some sports, man. I need to talk about some sports. <laughs> My takes are getting so hot, I can't even cool oh. it down. Oh, man. We bike, we bike. Oh, goodness. It's funny when I go to... Me not being able to talk. Let me go over here to Marco to the forefront. For whatever reason, it's just me. What's up, guys? It's the Ryan Show. <laughs> the Ryan Show. That sounds that has a nice little ring to it. Ryan, let me get this fixed. Everybody can we see some about live editing on air. Relationships in sports. <laughs> the Ryan Show. <laughs> Welcome to the Ryan Zone. Have you ever tried to keep a relationship together yeah. and balance it with sports? <laughs> Now you got the nice, the nice soothing background that go along with that theme too. Right. <laughs> Welcome to the relationship ASMR. Today's the Ryan show. I'm your host, of course, Ryan. Ryan. <laughs> um. Yeah, man. I miss talking sports with you guys too. Uh, it was a nice little break, though. I will admit that. You know, sometimes it's nice to get away from this routine, but. You know, I feel like we're about to start coming really hard here. We're going to be move, making some moves. Do, change Pause. Some Pause. Pause. <laughs> I tried to sneak it out to see if I, if y'all's immaturity would let it go or maturity would let it go. But no, nope, I should have known better. <laughs> I should have known better. <laughs> um, yeah, we're going to be, we got a lot of things working in this behind the scenes and hopefully going to be growing and be able to give y'all more content. And a lot more uh, interaction soon here. So we're working on things, guys. Stick with us. I think it's going to turn out pretty cool. Anyway, I'll go for it, Marco. You had something. In- no, I was just saying, yeah. Because yeah. he said it's going to turn out cool. And I said, yeah. Um, Let's take it on down the road, Marco. Let's get between the hashes. Blue 32. Blue 32. Ha, ha, ha. Welcome to the Grits Blitz. I'm Ryan. Today we're going to be talking about... I'm not going to do the Micah voice. Let, let me let Micah <laughs> keep his own thing. Um, Yeah, uh, so since the last time we spoke, there's been a lot going on in the NFL world. Not so much with training camps. We're obviously going to cover that. But as far as movements, as far as... You know, contracts go as far as the whole COVID thing that's now sneaking its dirty little head back into the NFL world. There's been a lot going on. So we're going to cover a couple of those things, give you all, all our, our opinions on those, talk about some of the, the things that happened, and uh, then we're going to get into the Falcons training camp. So stick around with us. It's going to be probably a pretty long segment. Um, but first and foremost... Y'all know that guy up north that plays on the far, far parts of New York by a lake? There's lots of crazy people the Canadian, up there. The Canadian, the Canadian part folk. Of <laughs> Legit. <laughs> Niagara East, essentially. Um, you know, they, ju- they they jump through tables and stuff. That they're they're kind of weird. You know that guy, that their quarterback? I think his name is Jash. Jash. Yeah. He, uh, he just got broke the fuck off. That is a rich, rich man. Uh, he signed a six-year, $258 million contract today with $150 million guaranteed. 
And, you know, as, as we talked about many times on the show, quarterbacks are going to get paid. It's just what their positional group gets. They get the most money on the team. Then it's your tackles slash pass rushers and maybe a, an elite wide receiver all right in there. Yeah. But not if you're here in Atlanta. You need to get, get on up <laughs> out of town. <laughs> um, Quarterbacks get paid like NBA players. Tack, uh, tackles. Tackles wish they made close to <laughs> Well, the good, good tackles will get about 17, 18 million. 17 or 18. Yeah. <laughs> That's still like, pretty good, though. That's a good goes, chunk of your chain. Uh, I think it goes like man, QBs, I, rushers, skill players, then O linemen. Yeah. Or receivers. Imagine, I imagine, running backs, running backs. imagine being an elite tackle and it's like, man, I protect this fool and he's making three times what I make. <laughs> man, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's off top, but it, that's why you got to go like uh, when um, Trey and John got their deals, like uh, Solomon was like, yo, uh, I saw such and such bought their guys Rolexes. Just saying, though, <laughs> it's like that's why you if you're that QB, you got to break your lineman off some crazy gifts, ATVs, uh, vacations, Rolexes. The whole man, I need at least a steak dinner, <laughs> man. <laughs> steak dinner. I'm telling you, those. Those after season or before season gifts or you know contract gifts that that some linemen have gotten from quarterbacks like the packages you don't typically hear about them unless someone posts it to social media. But man, when you're talking about rich people gifts, like these are rich people gifts. It's like I wish, I wish I could just buy one of those things, and they're dropping like seven of them across their offensive line and their right. you know, their running backs. It's like good lord, that's just a, a different type of world. Um. I am actually going to post this in the Discord real quick because I forgot to do that. And uh, that's a reminder. Actually, guys, if you listen to us frequently or you watch us frequently and you tune in and you like our opinions and you like what we talk about, join the Discord. It's actually really cool. Uh, we got about 35 people in there right now talking about sports. Marco makes an appearance every now and then when he remembers that he has the app on his phone. <laughs> Um, but we're and in there. That's, that's Ryan's world, and he's going to start providing a lot more news and and it, everything. It's a good starting point for where we're going to grow into some things and uh, areas that we want to to dip our that's toes cool. into. Uh, but it's just a good way to talk sports with people that know what they're talking about and that are passionate about sports. You know, that's what mm-hmm. we are. We're, we're three passionate sports people, and you know, most of the people that we have in there are the same. There's some that are more casual than us, but it's just a good time in general. We talk about NFL, MLB, all the things that we talk about here, then plus the, you know, the surrounding areas. We'll talk about movies and stuff like that. So if it sounds like something you like to do and you don't really have a a group chat or you have like, like the reason I started this is because I had like nine different group chats all talking about sports. I was like, this is really annoying to talk to people here, 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 here. There's a good way to do this, and it's way more organized. And so that's when I started the Discord thing. But um, during football season, I'll probably be a lot more active in there. There's just football. not a lot of sports to talk about right now. Yeah, and that's what I was thinking about too, because I was like, a lot of people, you know, they're they're doing vacation time and stuff like right now. When it gets cold out and people want to start talking, you know, sitting on their couch and talk about it more, it's a great place Cry to do about it. the Falcons together. Yeah, literally, come commiserate with us in in Discord. <laughs> Can you believe what we just saw? <laughs> And as that grows, you know, it could it it could change in ways that we broadcast as well. And oh, for the future, we do have a current Division One athlete that is a five star recruit that will be coming on and doing a question and answer uh, in the Discord at some point in the future. We just got to nail that down. So it's another reason to do it. We'll have we'll bring some guests on. We'll bring some athletes in and do things like that. We do have someone booked for the end of the season that is a current. Uh, major league player for their sport that will be coming in at the end of the season doing a question and live in there. And, you know, we may even have some of the guys from the radio uh, on. But that's me. I like Discord. I think it's a cool thing. I'm going to try and sell it to whoever I can. The um, Discord. Join the Discord. Not a sponsor. Even though that sound, sounded like a full-on sponsor for Discord right there. That that was our ad for the day, the ad read for the episode. Let's go. Um, so back to Josh Allen and his basketball like contract that he signed. 
there's a lot of things in there, uh, and I, you know, I was talking about them before we got cut off last time, but it's a, it's kind of like Patrick Mahomes. It has a lot of stipulations in it that allows it to be team-friendly in certain areas and player-friendly in others. Right now, this is most certainly a player-friendly part of the contract because he's about to get $100 million when he signed the contract. So, yeah, that's a lot of money for the team to pay out up front, but you take a lot of those bonuses out of the back end of the contract and free up a lot of space for you to make moves. So, with all that being said, do you guys think Josh Allen was deserving of this contract? What's your opinions of it? What you know, even what's your opinion about Josh Allen? Uh, and who do you think is the next quarterback up to get that type of contract and get that type of look for an extension? And Micah. Like I mentioned before, you are our resident quarterback contract hater, or as we like to frame you. Um, what's your opinion on this, man? I know you like Josh Allen, so. Yeah, I mean, I think the ceiling on Josh Allen is really high because of how physically gifted he is. I mean, dude has an absolute rifle for an arm of bazooka. Not, not Probably the right strongest arm in the NFL, honestly. He, yeah, yeah. It, not to mention, he's like the white Movic. Even though he looks really goofy when he's running, he, he's moving. Like, <laughs> he, he runs like Lurch, but but he's actually like moving and like making... He's covering some this. ground for sure. <laughs> so yeah, it's like... um, my My thing is, I question... I question, like, when you invest that much into one player, it eventually it will affect the team, and you're going to have to cut out resources in other areas. So, like, and a lot of times it's defensively or offensive line. And what happens, I mean, that's essentially what happened in um, Seattle is they chose defense over protecting – uh, Russell Wilson. So what happened is you skimped on the offensive line. You had Pro Bowl as the offensive line. You traded them away to get them weapons, and then you paid your defense. So now, six seven years later, he's like, "Yo, I need an offensive line." Well, uh, <laughs> well, you know, let's throw a dart at the board and see if we can draft one that can uh, protect you for the future. So that's really that's my biggest that's my biggest thing when you start to get into that territory that's astronomical numbers as far as football football uh, contracts go it's like bro like when when he gets around 2025 when i think it I, I read that it hits his contract hits about 51 million dollars like his cap hit for that season it's, Hold it up, it's I got like, it right here Keep going. I'll pull it up while you're talking. Um, yeah, yeah. So when when his I, I read that, like I said, his cap hit, his highest cap hit would be fifty one million dollars in twenty twenty five, I believe. And so when you get there, so say the cap is two hundred, uh, like two hundred and ten million dollars. I mean, that's <laughs> that's a well over. That's I mean, that's a quarter of your that's a quarter of your payroll right there. So. I just I just have a hard time believing that one player it, it, that one player does necessarily deserves to make that much more than everybody else on his on his team. So Yeah, I hear what you're saying. I think just like we saw with Matt Ryan, he's probably not gonna get to some of those those high numbers. They'll probably be shifted, they'll be manipulated and things like that. So I'd be really surprised if we saw Josh Allen hit those fifty fifty million dollars without seeing an extension. Mm -hmm. But Marco, what you got um, for us? So a couple things, whether he deserves it or not. I mean, I don't really want to get into that because do any of these guys really deserve to get paid this much? I mean, it's well, it's a relative when, thing, right? Especially when, in his case, especially when you're in a market like Buffalo. I know there is profit sharing, but no one's tuning in to see buffalo play any kind of game so, so like it's not like the the nba stuff or even the pat mahomes thing where he's literally box office but what what's funny about this contract is that so obviously 
this makes him the second um, highest paid quarterback in the league on average um, at 43 uh, and some change. But it's funny that they didn't, they had the opportunity to, to get him above Pat Mahomes, but they're like, bro, we, you're not better than Pat Mahomes. We're not going to, we're not going to give you that kind of money. Um, can't go past that. Can't, can't, right. Yeah. No, can't hit that. One. <laughs> Even though it's only like 2 million more, <laughs> but it's like, uh, I think, you know, like he, he's, he has, he's very tight. He's a like great talent level, but in terms of like mind and just, running the quarterback position it remains to be seen whether he's a great quarterback because i see him miss some throws my mind you he doesn't always have weapons but then you got to consider is he ever going to have weapons in buffalo who wants to go to buffalo i mean it's he's got digs he's got stefan digs yeah. right but i mean he had him last year and he like missed him a lot so yeah. well i mean he he turned John Brown into a relevant name two years like, ago. Hey, and that's true. Number, I mean, legit that's what I'm saying. He, he's really good. And but you know, I'm sort of with Mike in this, where it's like, and at the same, it's, it's a double edged sword. But it's like I almost think that eventually, or maybe never, because the the cap's going to keep on going up. But it's like there should be like an arbitrary percentage that not that no one player can go above of yeah. the team's cap. Because it just doesn't make any sense. And I know there's not enough talent to go around. So it's like, you're, you're probably not going to, even if you your quarterback only takes this much, there's no guarantee you're going to be able to fill in all that space with um, other talent. Because, you know, talent isn't at a surplus anyway. So I see why they pay these players so much percent of their cap. But at the end of the day, it's like, if you really want to win, it doesn't make sense to pay a player that much money. And um, to answer the other half of your question, I think, the next quarterback that's going to get broke off is Kyler Murray. Um, oh, yeah. Not, I answer that. not Lamar. Oh, I forgot about Lamar. No, Kyler Micah. Murray. <laughs> Micah, who, who, who do you got? Um, is, is Lamar not getting broke off yet? No, no, not yet. Let's see where he's at. I Like I said, I think Lamar will get broken off. I, well, I said in the Discord, I think Lamar will get broken off, but I think it'll be slightly less. If they do it this year, it'll be slightly less than – than what Josh Allen got. Okay, I didn't know he – wait, let me take that back. So, I think, yeah, Lamar will be – they'll probably give Lamar, like, 44, uh, to be honest. Um, yeah. But then out of the, the crop of players who haven't gotten paid yet, because I thought he would have gotten paid by now. I think it's yeah. – um, You got Dak Kyler Prescott, Murray. Kyler Murray. Um, Dak, Deshaun, Dak got paid. Dak Deshaun, got paid. Oh, yeah, Dak, Dak did – yeah, I forgot about that weird yeah. contract he signed. Um. Deshaun, I believe, is no, he he got signed no, as well. Yeah. Yeah, he's got he's got like three years left on his deal. Yeah, he signed um, that just in time for him not to be playing. Besides yeah. besides uh Lamar, it's Kyler and Baker who are the next two. Baker, that was the guy that yeah. But yeah. Baker's probably gonna get like forty or under that, maybe thirty nine. Uh, yeah, they might keep Baker in the thirties probably. I just my my thing with um Lamar though is after this past season with catching COVID getting and then getting injured in the playoff game and then your numbers slightly declining uh, after coming off of the, the MVP season, it's like his, I, I just don't think he has enough leverage to get around Mahomes' money. He might, he, he's going to get good, but I don't think he'll get 40 plus million a year. I just, I think he may be slightly under Josh Allen just because Josh Allen's coming from, you know, AFC championship game. So, yeah, yeah. those are all solid points. It's just, you know, we'll see. Cause mm -hmm. Josh Allen, like, like, like I said earlier, he's got all the physical talents. He could easily, if he get puts it all together up here, he could be like Aaron Rodgers level because of his mm -hmm. ability to move, his ability to throw the ball accurately with force. <laughs> when a, like but then he'll have those moments that he needs to get together because then he'll vacillate yeah to the complete yeah. opposite end of the spectrum and throw a ball 10 yards over open receiver and it's like he's like an extremely talented mitch trubisky it's like yeah that's a good yeah. comparison yeah i like yeah. that oh i uh i mitch trubisky wishes he had some of the arm <laughs> Because yeah, I remember, I still, I'll never forget that play in the in the playoffs where Josh Allen is like falling out of bounds. Yeah, he's parallel to the ground and throws the ball like fifty something yards. Like, like how, 
with how, no torque. It's like, like how did he get that? Like, that bro, elbow is so what? strong. Just whoo. like, dude, what, did, what were you throwing bells of hay up, right. the, up in Montana or wherever you're from? <laughs> that, I mean, that's like that's God given because what exercise can you even do to be yeah. able to do something like that? <laughs> just have an incredibly, incredibly strong core and just a tendon in your elbow that's just tuned yeah. perfectly. Right, because it's, it's it's so much elbow. Because you're not when you're not even on the ground, when you don't even have any kind of like leverage from the ground, how do you throw that hard? Well, I, it's I'll all you, elbow. Too, yeah, because because both him and Pat Mahomes made throws like that. Pat Mahomes did it in the Super Bowl like a couple times and hit his receivers in the face with the ball, which <laughs> yes. was in, incredible. But Josh Allen sailed it over everybody's head and it was just like, bro. <laughs> Right. Look at that. That was like the high. That was the most that, that missed throw is like the most impressive throw of the game. I was like, what? How did he do that? That that those two players are crazily talented. Excuse me. Uh but yeah, so in other quarterback news, the the guy that I made a, a comparison to earlier, Aaron Rodgers, who I think well, since the last time we broadcasted. He was still holding out. They hadn't come to terms. And no one really knew what was going to happen about Aaron Rodgers. There were there were articles coming out every day. It's like, Aaron Rodgers to announce retire, or retirement I- imminently. And it's like, well, things are getting close between Aaron Rodgers and team. And no one knew what was going on because neither side was really giving much. But they were giving, giving enough to let you know that there definitely was a problem. So... He announced that he was coming back. Uh, They said he will be signing, you know, he'll be coming back to the team with stipulations when it first broke. And they didn't really say what that was. They just said, because some of the rumblings was that he was not very happy with what was going on on the team, but we didn't know exactly what. You didn't know if the team had done something wrong. You didn't know if they just said something about him or just throwing him under the bus some some type of way. But you knew he had a problem with the team. So... When he came back, he immediately held a press conference. And in that press conference, he did something I've never seen a pro athlete do so thoroughly, so elegantly, and just like, it was like watching a skilled surgeon slice apart a team, like do just enough to hurt you really bad, but not put himself in danger and sound a certain way. And I was like, wow, like that's a skill. He he learned that from uh, Alex Trebek and uh, when he took over Jeopardy. Well, man, I'm telling you, even more polished. <laughs> like Aaron is a smart guy. That was one of the things about him, uh, and the reason they compared. What was your boy's name coming out of UCLA, Micah? Uh, Josh Josh Rosen. Yeah, one of the reasons they compared Rosen to him because they're both very intelligent, very in their heads type of guys. Kind of socially awkward, can fit into the team, but it was like cerebral. Yeah, honestly. And it's part of the reason that Aaron Rodgers is so good because he knows the game so well. But in that press conference, he they had meant he had mentioned, I should say, that he didn't feel like he was a part of the the team, uh, the team's image, I should say, or the uh vision, sorry, the vision for the future. The team was making all the decisions, they weren't consulting him at all. And he had seen, you know, other quarterbacks around the league of his same stature had had input on this type of stuff. And he was like, you know what? Like I'm an, I'm a former MVP. I've won a Super Bowl here. I'm consistently at the top of the quarterback rankings in every category. Why are they not consulting me? I should be, I should have some input on this. And so he apparently took that to them. They said they were going to give him more input and they did, they did one more thing that really pissed him off. And he's like, that's it. So he said, I will come back if you give me more input on, roster moves such as cutting and signings like that's the big thing and kind of implied like depth chart positioning as well and this is like this is like Brady level stuff this is like the the type of stuff that Brady can go and be like all right look I'll sign with you or I'll play with you if I can tell you who I want and what type of players I want um and he's earned it in all honesty he's earned it and I don't think there's many other quarterbacks in the league that could do that um so, 
there's I don't know I, I don't know how I want to ask this. After all said and done, after everything we heard about Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers, who do you think won this? Who do you think benefits from this the most? Is it team based? Is it player based or what? Just what's your input on all this? Like, because there was a lot to take in and a lot to really get into. So, Marco, I want to hear what you you thought about all this. Like, have you ever seen anything like this? Any sport? Well, I mean, I think that, I mean, I sort of, I don't want to say I called it, but I did. And I said he was going to be back there and that he wasn't, you know, nothing was going to happen because, I mean, I like the way that he, he came out he's good enough to where he can come out here and say how he really feels about the management, especially knowing that his coach is like younger than him. <laughs> like, But it's like, you know, I, I think obviously green Bay benefits more because any team that got Aaron Rodgers would have instantly been a contender. And obviously he would have had to pull a, um, what's my man's name? Uh, a Carson Palmer to get oh, yeah. out of there. And he, we would we had to, we would have missed him for a whole season, but yeah, I mean, green Bay wins, Aaron Rodgers, you know, we're never going to know behind the scenes if they're really listening to him, but I really, I doubt that they're going to just suddenly start letting Aaron Rodgers call shots. And that's why he was so vocal about it because you don't come out and say all that stuff if they've suddenly given you your way, you know what I mean? Yeah. So him being that vocal just tells you that, okay, nothing really probably changed, but they came to some type of agreement. They're not, but they're not going to let Aaron Rodgers come in there and start making personnel decisions and stuff well, like that. So one, one Green thing, Bay win. one thing that came out here just yesterday was actually that Green Bay has agreed to trade Aaron Rodgers next season if they don't meet his his points. Like so, they're going to trade Aaron Rodgers next season. <laughs> <laughs> Micah, what? When has an NFL team ever been like, oh yeah, this guy's going to call? A-. I mean, I know he said there's degrees to this, but. You just uh, don't – even Tom Brady at his best wasn't making personnel decisions. Well, That's the best uh, part of that we've ever seen. Man, uh, he made his own – he had the owner make a personnel decision because because Bill Belichick was dead set on trading Tom Brady about two years before he did. And Tom, true, went, true. Tom went straight to uh, Robert Kraft. It was like, uh, no, tell, tell, uh, tell your coach, no, he can't move me. <laughs> right, but I mean, so that's Aaron's Aaron's fault for not politicking with the owner. But at the same time, it's like, well, you know, the, Tom Brady still didn't get everything he wanted. I, I Those are two totally of, different personalities, too. I, yeah. yeah. I, wait, doesn't the city of Green Bay own the Green Bay Packers? Fifty so, percent hey, of it. Green Bay. <laughs> Don't there, let them. not like that. That fifty percent is not making any personnel decisions either. <laughs> Well, that was one of the things I remember when all this was going on. I caught an interview on 92 Nine the Game. It was like during the weekend when none of the, the major guys are on, and they brought on someone from Green Bay that, that writes for their, their newspaper there. And he said it was the most divided he's ever seen the, the fan base. And because all those fans feel like they do have a say in that, you know, there was a lot of it, – it changed the way that the whole town was being ran and the, the way the whole town felt. So he definitely – like Aaron Rodgers left an impact on that town mm. and had put a dent in that organization. I feel like not so much like their names, but their ability to really to big dick a player is the best way I can like, look, we're the green Bay Packers. Like we are, we are the football team. Like that's who you think about when football first came around. Like it's the Packers. Like that's who we are. And like Aaron Rodgers, like, you know what? I'm motherfucking Aaron Rodgers. You're right. They're I'm a bad. With me. I'm a bad motherfucker. Like, <laughs> have you have you seen what I do on the field? Like, <laughs> I just want to make sure we're like you're the Packers. Yeah, I get it. Ooh, you're. I'm Aaron Rodgers. Like, uh, Aaron I've never hold, hold on, Micah. I've never heard more cornerbacks come out and say that they were afraid when he looked their way than when Aaron Rodgers did it. Now, nah, Aaron Rodgers essentially pulled a uh, Denzel Washington training day moment. <laughs> you motherfuckers. <laughs> King Kong ain't got shit on me. <laughs> I mean, honestly, nah, uh, I feel like that's what he's needed to do for the longest time. Well, I, I mean, so my my opinion on the whole matter is, like you said, who, who won, who lost? I think 
ultimately, I think Aaron Rodgers won. And by default, because Aaron Rodgers won, Green Bay is going to win. Because one of the things that I've, I've said, and I've, I've been saying when this thing first happened, is, you know, Aaron Rodgers has a reason to gripe. Because that offense wasn't outside of the running backs. They do have, they did have good weapons at running back. But, you know, ever since, like, ever since they lost us in the NFC Championship game, then they started to break up that receiver core. And it was like, all right, well, you know, Greg Jennings, go, all right, you can go. All right, Jordy Nelson, you can go. All right, uh, James Jones, you can go. All right, uh, like, and, and they just kept, oh, Jared Cook, you can go too. Um, it's like all of these good weapons that they had for him to throw to, they they got rid of all of them. They didn't want to pay any of them. So he's just like, dude, I built up a rapport all these years. We, we've gone so far with all of these guys, and then you let all of them go. And not only did you let all of them go, you don't even really try to draft replacements for them. Right. And and so you got Devontae Adams, who is a monster. Absolutely. He's top five receiver in the league right now. You have, but then everybody else is, you know, uh, Val, uh, Valdez, what, Scantling. Marquez, Val, Valdez Scantling. You got Equinemius St. Brown. Um, what's the what's the other receiver's name? Um, what there? With the L. Uh, shoot, I can't think of his name right now. But, oh, uh, Laz- Lazard. Oh, yeah. Um, Alan Lazard, Lazard. Yeah. Alan Lazard, Lazard. And a lot of those guys were just inconsistent options and, and or were injury prone. So you didn't know who legitimately was going to – he didn't know week by week who was going to be his number two receiver, let alone, you know, con- any consistency, building a consistent rapport with those guys. Yeah, so – you know, you had Tanya. Tanya actually stepped up and you know did some big. Tanya played exceptionally well this season. He was a, a really good. He's he's oh, going to yeah. be a good tight end. Oh yeah, but but it was outside of um, Ad, Ad, Devontae Adams and Tanya. I mean, I, there was no real consistency of, of weapons for him to throw mm-hmm. to. So, you know, and and every year going into every draft. Now, granted. You know, I, I I understand a lot of these so-called experts, scouts, uh, think that they know so much better than, like, you know, analysts. Like, every year, the Falcons go into yeah. the draft. They're like, Falcons are going to receiver. Get a receiver in the first round. Top four That's pick, good. getting receiver. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, but but for everybody, I don't care who it was, was like, Green Bay needs a receiver. They need a better up. They need an upgrade at the number two across from Devontae Adams to help, you know, free him up so he doesn't just draw double coverage all day. And the front office is like, no, we're just going to keep drafting defense. And even even with all of the moves and the the money and capital they invested in defense and offensive line, the defense still was just mediocre at best. <laughs> so it was like. All right. Yeah, they they never, you know, statistically they're in the middle of the pack. So they're a pretty good like, defense, though. They're they had some good pieces and and you had the guy Preston Smith and uh Zadarius Smith, they could show up at times, but you also had games where they were just non existent. So, you know, it, it's it's one of those things like, all right, well, I need some help. And y'all don't want to get it. So he finally put his foot down and said, screw it. Um, and and basically, he pulled a LeBron. He pulled a LeBron move, essentially. And yeah. was like, I need help. Uh, and I'll thre- I will threaten the league if you don't get me the help I want. So The Packers are about right where you'd expect them. But by the way, we both described them. They were, they were at 13. Yeah. They, were, they were pretty good. They, they had some... Know, some games and they were like that's what you should be doing but there was definitely others but um well, yeah that, especially minnesota because they beat up on uh on what's his name yeah uh, i mean i think the the defense is really going to take a step up for year this year for them and 
with some of the moves that has happened. You know, they they drafted Amari Rodgers this this year, which was probably part of listening to Aaron Rodgers' input because that's that's that position that they had lost so long ago when they let a lot of these guys go. Like the James Jones was a great slot guy. Randall Cobb was a great slot guy. Um, Jordy could move inside of the slot and really do work there. Like Devontae can move anywhere, but you really need that guy inside that can open up the outside for Devontae. Yeah. So, uh, when he came back, one of the first moves that the Packers made is they re or they traded for Randall Cobb, who was down with the, for the Texans the last two years. And if y'all haven't seen it already, look at his, uh, his presser that he had when he came back to the Packers. He talks about, uh, he just came back from the dark side, essentially. He's like, oh God, the Packers are one of those places that you just want to be. And, you know, I've been to the other side. So he's like, he was really gracious to be back. So we're going to move on to one last quarterback news here. And it's to a guy that, you know, when the news broke, we're kind of like, okay, you know, it's not really surprising, but at the same time, it was kind of like, damn, I, I wanted to see what he could do down there. And uh, Carson Wentz just went down. I think it was two, two days ago. They officially announced that he's going to be out for five to 12 weeks with the foot injury, because he's going to go seek, uh, he's going to go seek a second opinion, but more than likely it's going to lead to, s- to surgery, and he's going to go ahead and nip that foot problem in the bud. Because what they said was, with the way he injured his foot, he can wait four weeks and see, just take four weeks off and be like, okay, I hope it gets better, or he could have surgery now and be out anywhere from five to twelve weeks. So he took the surgery option, and he's going to miss quite a bit of time, and that's too, you know, that that move right there. Had a lot of NFL team or a lot of NFL experts, the you know Micah's favorite experts out there predicting that the the Colts were an AFC Championship, you know not favorite, but they were one of the, one of the top three. They already had a really good defense. Their offensive line it was one of the best out there. And then you add someone like Carson Wentz, who most think just had an off season last year that it, the message had grown stale and he just didn't get it done. Plus injuries, etc. Et he was going to go to a good team here and really do some damage. So that leaves a huge question mark behind the line. You know, the, the general of their team is now in doubt. At the very best, Wentz is going to get cleared in five weeks. He's going to miss week one of the season. He's going to miss a lot of, like, rhythm and chemistry days here in camp with his receivers. And it's going to take him a while to hit his mark, even if he does come back after five weeks. So that leaves us with, who do the Colts fall back on now to lead their team, to be the signal caller for them, and to step right in and have them not miss too much of a beat, uh, which they were expecting to, you know, hit their 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 real sh- their stride this year as far as being real contenders this year with Carson Wentz. So who can they look to? Who's the the savior to the all the Colts woes right now? And will they, whoever it is, will they be able to keep them in contention? Like Wentz would have, Marco. What do you mean? Who's the savior? Like, they're just quarterbacks out here that we don't know about that they're just gonna go pick up. You want to go get Andrew Luck and coax him out of retirement? There I you mean, go. There's, there's no savior for this team. It's over. Like, um, when you say five to twelve weeks, you don't have one to three months. Like that's that basically means we don't know what the hell they're right. talking about. So. Well, it could get better. <laughs> like so. There's no savior for this team. It's over for this season. Let me um, let me tell you. I mean, uh, Nick Foles. I, yeah. no, I know. I know who's on the roster. Who is it, Micah? Who do you got? Who's going to be there? Your savior? boy. Your boy. J- Jacob Eason is going to step up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, nah, I mean, I don't think. Yeah, Jacob Eason. Would would he be? Great, no. The, the think, question is, will he be good? <laughs> well, well, I think not even I, talk about great. To be perfectly honest with you, oh wow! So they got uh, Jacob Eason, they got Brett Hundley and Sam Elliott. And so, uh, Sam Elliott, yeah. Currently, the available quarterback free agents. I'll go through a couple of them. There's a long list here, but we'll see. Anybody that stands up. You said they have Brett Hundley now, Micah. Yeah. Yes, Brett Hundley, Ellinger, and, um, and Eason's uh, the Jacob starter. Eason, he's, yeah, Yikes. he's the current starter. So you've got 
your boy that you mentioned before the show started. You got RG threes out there. Um, he's done. He said he's staying in shape. Then there's Philip Rivers, who actually threw his hat in the ring and said he's staying in football shape. So he said can... he won't come back till the high school season's over. <clears throat> yeah, we'll see. I wonder how much money they can throw his way to be like, hey, come give this a shot. Uh, you've got Joe Webb, Jamie Newman, Josh Johnson. Johnson. Oh, wow. Your I boy Drew Stanton, there. Micah, is still a free agent. Carrying those cables. And then there's the man who saved the Washington football team last year, Alex Smith. Is still he's retired, but he is still mm. out there. I wish I hope he doesn't come back. Yeah. So, I hope so too. Does, do any of those names stick out or you know, y'all are just gonna stick stay the course and see what you got on the roster? Who was the second yeah. one you said? The second one I said, RG3 and Rivers. Yeah. Um, Jamie Newman, Josh Johnson, Drew, Drew Stanton. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I still think if I'm the Colts, I, I ride with Jacob Eason um, and just heavy on the creativity. Because, I mean, this is, this is the same – Frank Reich is one of the biggest reasons uh, the Eagles won the Super Bowl back uh, a few years ago. So what you what you do is you get as creative as possible. You run heavy. You have good running backs uh, between, you know, Jonathan Taylor. You got uh, Naeem Hines. You got Marlon Max. You got some depth there. You got some versatility there. And and try to limit – is if, if – Try to limit the tough throws you force Jacob Eason to make early on. And if you do, if you can be successful with that, if you can move the chains without making him have to do too much and like allowing him to kind of build up his confidence, then you might be able to stay afloat at least um, until Carson Wentz comes back and hope it will, and you hope that. Carson Wentz is closer to the five weeks as opposed to the 12 weeks. Cause if he's, if he's out six weeks, then you might be able to stay, you might be stay afloat, you know, three, four, three, four games and stay in contention. But if he, if you're looking at 12, you're looking at him not coming back until, you know, halfway through the season. So yeah, hopefully if it's if it's three or four games, I think you just ride with uh Jacob Eason and or whoever which whichever one of those backups and just see see what you got there. Cause honestly, between Jacob Eason and Sam Ellinger, you already know what you got in Brett Brett Hunley. Brett Hunley isn't Lost. really a, a, and yeah, he's not an NFL quarterback. But <laughs> this is your chance to see Jacob Eason and Sam Ellinger. Which one, which, which, well, I think Ellinger would probably be a scout team, but to see what you have in in Jacob Eason, could he potentially be a solid quarterback for the future in the event that Carson Wentz doesn't work out? So, all right. Um, real quick, I I agree with that. I think the one positive from this is I think Eason has talent. So, if anything, they can see, you know, what his his level you know because it takes a lot of guys you know years to become good to great quarterback so you know maybe mm-hmm. he'll have an opportunity to really prove himself that he is you know as talented as we all thought he was at one point I mean, Easton's definitely got one thing that's arm talent that, yeah. that man can sling the ball plus he plus he sat behind a very smart quarterback in Philip Rivers last year so right mm-hmm. yeah yeah I mean I'm sure he's way better than you know, UGA last saw him, and even Washington last saw him. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's way better than Hundley and Ellinger, that's for sure. One would hope. I mean, he could be one of those guys that comes in, though, and you're just like, man, you just look so bad at this level. Those guys <laughs> that just tear it up in college, and you get to this level, and you're like, what happened? Brett, well, Brett Hundley was one of them. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, so we actually got our first taste of NFL football for the season – Yesterday, when the Hall of Fame game happened, it was the Cowboys versus the Steelers. And when I say that, I mean the 
Cowboys second and third stringers versus the Steelers second and third stringers. And it was, it made for some bad football, man. It was really, really ugly. I think the final score wound up being three to 19. Let me get that right for you. Really? It got that high? When I was watching, it was three like to three 16. To six. It was like three to six at the end of the third quarter. Yeah, three to three to sixteen was the final score. The cow, the Cowboys kicker missed. I want to say three. Let's see. Oop, if the page finishes loading yeah. here, kicking. He was one for three on the day. Yeah. Uh, so he he really blew some things and. Get off your knees! You're blowing the game. It, I mean, even then, if he would have made them both, it still would have been sixteen to, to nine. But at least they would have been within striking distance at that yeah. point. But there's been a lot of rumbling in up in the Pittsburgh area here recently. And a lot of national media was like, you know, this is just, this is your typical camp Homer fans getting excited about their players that they just brought in. And they're overrating them. And people are like, it, look, it's Dwayne Haskins. We, you know, okay, chill out. You're, I don't know why you're this excited. But... There's been a lot of rumbles, rumbling coming out of there that Haskins may look like he's finally starting to put it all together, and this system is the perfect fit for him. And we, in this game, we saw that Haskins, you know, behind Ben Roethlisberger and possibly the future to the franchise is going to be in Haskins if he can keep doing that because Josh Dobbs never panned out after coming out of Tennessee. Mason Rudolph isn't the same after Garrett, um, Miles Garrett, Smashed him in the head with he his. Wasn't that good before either. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, he people are like, oh, we could, you know, we can, we can kind of make it a couple games with Mason Rudolph, but no, you can't. That's not a thing. That's not going to happen. So Dwayne Haskins actually went eight for thirteen last night, uh, fifty-four yards. Mason Rudolph went six for nine for eighty-four, but just didn't look like he had it had control of the offense nearly as well as Haskins did. And then on the other side, the Cowboys threw out three quarterbacks that really shouldn't be in the NFL at all. Ben DiNucci is so bad. Garrett Gilbert, just, he ain't it. Mm-hmm. And then I think they also put in Rush, that Cooper Rush guy. Yeah, Cooper Rush. And he got, he, every every play I saw him in, he got not, he got put on the ground. I was like, ah! Man, I'm telling you. <laughs> Hut, sack! <laughs> like, it was just, I mean, the Steelers, they're, they're going to, they're a good defense every year, and they, even their backups are usually pretty good too. So those poor backup quarterbacks are like, why are they in my lap after the, you know one second? But um, it, I don't know what else to say about this game other than I've got a real problem because I was watching it. And I was like, man, that's some really nice punting by Presley. Like when I start looking at that, I'm like, man, I love football. That, look at the football fan in you. That, that those are some great punts. You see that spiral on that one, man. Well, <laughs> Presley actually did exceptionally well. And for those of y'all that don't know, his uh, this is Ray Presley, I believe his first name is. He was the guy uh, award winner for the at a college last year. He was the best punter in the nation. He played at Georgia Tech, and he's the guy that looks like he should be like a linebacker, uh, a high school offensive lineman. He's built real oddly. Like he's not fat. He's just kind of big, but he's not strong looking. But man, he can punt the hell out of the ball. He he's a he's like six four, like two sixty, I think, at punter. He's mm-hmm. a big dude. And he's out there dropping bombs all over the field. And like he came in as their backup for the backup punter for this. And he got the start and had like three kicks within the tw- was inside the twenty. And then also right. dropped one right on the one. Yeah, and it it just died it on went, the one. It was thump. like that man. For those of y'all who don't know, special teams are very important in the NFL, and if you can uh-huh. do that to another team, it just makes everyone's job so much easier. Anyway, um, real quick, is Haskins for real, Micah Marco? Mm. He's much better than uh, Mason Rudolph, yeah. <laughs> but that's not that's not saying much. I mean, I think I think he finally 
um, matured. I think that situation in Washington forced him to kind of grow up a little bit. So, yeah, I think he'll yeah, be I mean, all right. I think there's a cap. You know, he's never, I don't think he'll ever be a great quarterback, but I think he can be good. Uh, and I think, like, he's, you know, the best option that they have. You know, like you said, definitely better than Rudolph. You know what I mean? He's, I think he's proven that in his limited amount of time in the league, even though he hasn't done much. I think he can win games. He's not, he's not great. And he's not, you know, he doesn't have all the intangibles that great quarterbacks do, but I think he can win games. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I'll have to see it for a lot longer than just one preseason game and, um, a lot of rumblings in camp to, for for the man I saw coming out of Ohio State and and on the field in Washington to prove me wrong because he he's never impressed me one bit at all. He looked pretty good last night though, but again, going against second and third stringers, who cares? Right, and it, yeah. as a, as a former starter, right, exactly. Yeah, so but Mason Rudolph though, Ugh. Ugh. I mean. It, when Ben Roethlisberger retires, it's going to be drastically different up there in Pittsburgh. Yeah, drastically different. They better all, tank. They should tank this season and go ahead and get uh, Spencer. All, all defense. They're too good on defense to. to yeah, tank. that's true. <laughs> they'll, they'll lose every game six to three. <laughs> and they used to have one of the best offensive lines, and now it's just a shell of itself. And we're Grayson McCall, my guy. I'm gonna keep saying that name till it rings bells. <laughs> um, that's the guy out of Coastal Carolina. Yeah. Where am I at here? Oh, did you guys see that hit coming out of Panthers camp the other day? Mm-mm. So they had a, a backup guy. His name is JT, JT eBay, I believe is uh, his last name is pronounced I B E eBay Ibi. I don't know. Uh, I apologize. But he, I mean, absolutely destroyed one of the receivers on the other, uh, on the Panthers and went head to head. Like, just like, like when you picture like what targeting and what illegal contact should be, that was it. And he sent the man to the hospital. Isn't that frowned upon? (laughs) Well, (laughs) the, the Panthers didn't like it too much and they liked it so little that they cut the man the next day. Yeah. They're like, you're out of here. Sorry, we don't do that here. Get out of town. You're not good who, enough to be doing that stuff. Who were they saying? They were saying that on the radio that, um, I forget who was saying it, one of these NFL guys. And they're like, young young guys will come in and then all the vets will quickly correct them when they start, like, you're really trying to hurt their other teammates and go hard like they're trying to earn a spot. It's like, bro, right. we don't do that in practice. <laughs> We're not trying to get injured and lose millions, you dummy. Yeah. Like, it's what one chance here. It's not like where you're on the roster for four years in college and like, oh, yeah, you messed up here, but you'll you'll get another shot. And then they target your own teammate? Oh, my God. Yeah, you I mean, I... Dumb as hell. Like, if you listen to, you know, Andy and Randy a lot, you'll hear Randy McMichael's stories frequently about how when he, he didn't do, like, recreational ball anything after that because anytime someone lined up across from you knowing that you're a professional athlete they're like oh yeah here's my chance to show that why right. why i should be in the league and whatnot yeah i the only, I, only thing i will say is you know that mentality though it's the i gotta do something to stand out otherwise you know i might not make the team i mean he's an, he's an undrafted he's an undrafted free agent so it's so like if he doesn't stand out, then his chance of making the team is slim and none. So, yeah, I mean, he went too hard in practice and, you know, it is what it is. But, you know, unfortunately, he, he hurt somebody. If he didn't hurt, if he didn't hurt the guy, then, you know, coaches might have liked his hustle. But, you know, it's a it's just an unfortunate situation. It's a dirty play all around. Like, you don't do that. Like, it's, I mean, even even if it's like regular live football you don't put the crown of your helmet into someone's ear yeah work on your form like don't just well, you know mean, when you're in practice i understand in games sometimes it's like okay i'm trying to get this guy down at any cost but in practice like work on your form <laughs> like uh, don't target people well i mean but 
I, I trust me, I'm not defending necessarily the hit. I'm just saying, hold on, let me pull it up and look at you it. You know, at the end of the day, this guy has an opportunity to potentially, he, his thing is I want to make the team or, you know, I go back to a year of limbo where I might not, where I, you fall like where most players, most undrafted players do and you just never make it. So I think he's, like I said, he went hard trying to, trying to make an impression and it went south. So that's all I'm saying. Let me see if I can find it. I found it earlier so I can play it for people. Not, uh oh, not seeing it here anymore. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but yeah, it wasn't like, I get the bang, bang. Here it is. All right, let me put this up for everybody so they can see it. Was this the one? Did they have a better angle than that? It. Here we go. Oh, we're all off. Mm -hmm. Ball five. I, no, we're we're still live. It's just for whatever reason, all of our videos shifted up. Like they like to do every now and then. Mm. Uh, I mean, watching the video, I can't really see anything too vicious. It's it's sort of I can't tell from this angle how bad it really is. Yeah. Uh oh. As he goes up to catch it, and then I don't know at what point the helmets collide. All right, here we go. I'll run it at half speed for you guys. Was it the guy on the outside with, who hit him with the helmet or the guy on the inside? I thought it was the guy on the inside, so we'll go half speed here. Number 27 or whatever this number is. It had to be wow, him. He it's, like, yeah, it's the guy who came in late and put his his shoulder right in the guy's head or neck area, like when the play was broken up. So was it the guy who landed on top of him or the guy who landed sort of behind him? Behind him. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, that was sort of like a lazy yeah. kind of. So I mean, it just wasn't clear, it wasn't yeah. clean at all. No, uh, I, yeah, I, I haven't seen, I still haven't seen the play, so it is what it is. Yeah. But anyway, it let's. Is, it, it's not as egregious as it sounds, but he it's sort of a lazy play. Yeah, let's uh, let's get to these next couple of NFL topics, then we're gonna get into the Falcons training camp stuff because this part's running real, real long. Uh, did you guys see where Joe Judge? Put his his boot in his team's ass the other day because there was a brawl during the practice. Mm -mm. Yeah, so apparently Jabril Peppers lit some a receiver up. Um, I think he hit Corey Clement got hit, and then Evan Ingram went over there and took up for his teammate. Obviously, you no know, offense takes up takes up for offense, the defense takes up for defense. Um, they got in there, they started going at it, and there was punches thrown. Daniel Jones somehow wound up at the bottom of the pile, and it was just, it was the like the worst thing that you could have happened. You're like, no, not our quarterback. What's going on? Don't you see the red jersey? But um, and apparently Jones was in there trying to like break it up. So I don't know if that's a you know his teammates will respect him more for that, or if that was like, no, you dummy, get out of there. <laughs> but um, he, he didn't pull a cam. No, Ooh, it's a pile. Ooh. <laughs> um as one of the biggest quarterbacks in the league. But anyway, so typically you'll see punishment happen behind closed doors or, you know, things will happen the next day. You know, they won't do it right there and they won't be reactionary. But Joe Judge being a former military man and running his football team as one, he mass punished everyone in front of the media, in front of the fans, and he made them run. And... You know, this could have gone very badly for a judge. It could have backfired. It could have really caused a divide. But it seemed like that it worked because typically if you're out there and you're you're you know, you're gonna make uh I don't know, like Saquon Barkley or you know, another player like Evan Ingram, he's not a great example, but Sterling Shepard. Someone could have been like, Wow oh, man, I'm not running, I'm not doing this high school type of stuff, and that would have been it. 
But he had that whole team out there running with him, running laps, and it really looked like a different Giants team from, you know, two years ago when he first took over. So what do y'all think about that? Is this a good thing for a team? Is this a bad thing for a team? Give me real quick answers because we want to get into the uh, these last couple topics and then into the training camp. Micah, what you got? Um, I mean, it's good that it's good the whole team's accountable. Um, as Falcon fans, we've seen what it's like when coaches don't hold players accountable for, you know, stupid, stupid behavior. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, like 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 Micah said, any any time you see that, you know, it's good to see people hold each other accountable. But the same old Giants, man, they're not gonna be good. Let's chill out. <laughs> I don't know, man. The, the Giants were a really good team down the stretch, but even without Saquon. That was with uh, Devontae Freeman getting way too many snaps for them. I forget who even won and, that division. Who won that Wayne, division? And Wayne Gallman. The Washington uh, football team. Washington. Washington won that division. That's right. Yeah, which is a good team. But we had our, our Hall of Fame induction or our Hall, Hall of Fame class announced, and this is a star-studded class this year. This is like the guys that – we all grew up watching we're like these guys are definitely going to make the hall of fame and here we are so one wow we're getting old some of the players that we we've watched for years are now retiring and going to the hall of fame but it's really cool to see these guys too so the headliners for the class were peyton manning charles woodson calvin johnson alan fanica john lynch uh senior committee choice drew pearson coach tom flores and contributor bill nunn the Centennial class includes five modern era selectees, Steve Atwater, Isaac Bruce, Steve Hutchinson, Edron James, and Troy Palomalu. Uh, the rest of the class is comprised of NFL Films president Steve Sable. Well-deserved. If none of y'all have ever watched NFL Films, go do it. It is a masterpiece. Uh, NFL Commissioner Paul Tagliabu, Executive George Young, Coaches Jimmy Johnson and Bill Cower. And then 10 players, Harold Carmichael, Jimbo Covert, Bobby Dillon, not Bob Dillon, Cliff Harris, Winston Hill, Alex Karras, I believe, Donnie Shell, Duke Slater, Max Speedy, and Ed Sprinkle is your 2021 NFL Hall of Fame class. All of those people are getting in? Well, yeah, they, they do it, and like that's why it's broken up. Like You won't see all of those guys get inducted. You'll see mainly the players, and the other guys will just be inducted. Um, they may so mention Tory Holt, Edron James, Calvin Johnson, Peyton Manning. Tory, Tory Holt wasn't on that. No, it was Isaac Bruce. Is who you Isaac, Isaac Bruce? Bruce yeah. Oh, my bad, yeah. my bad. Yeah, that's the Centennial class. What does that mean? I believe they do that for guys that are. Uh, let me get this right. A fame. It gives overlooked uh, players like that have passed their their time, and you know they because you only have a certain amount of times on on ballots, and mm-hmm. so they're like, okay, did we overlook someone? Are these people worthy? And so, because sometimes there's just you know players get unlucky and and wind up on ballots where it's where it's Peyton Manning, Charles Woodson, Calvin Johnson, Alan Fanica, John Lynch. Like that's like so star studded. These guys were the best of the best at their positions for so long. So. It's a cool class to see. I'm excited. Did y'all see any, anybody on there that, you know, or was there anybody missing that you you think should have been on there? I know it's hard to keep up with, with if they're eligible or not. There's a lot of people, man. They didn't miss nobody. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, you got anybody that you feel like should should be involved? Um, Yeah, not, not nobody else I can think of. I mean, like Marco said, it's a big class. It's... um. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to skip this last part. You know, Matt Ryan had an interview the other day. He was kind of hinting at, you know, what the future of the franchise is talking about what the, the end of his career kind of alluded to that. So if you haven't seen that, go see it. It's really good. Also, if you haven't seen the day in the life the other day where they, the Falcons let Jacob Tua Toy Mariner carry on the camera, that was really entertaining. He's another member of the, the beanbag boys, because we had foyer last year. Mike, are you going to make it, sir? Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so let's get on to the Falcons training camp. This last week, 
camp was in full swing. They actually reported the Friday before to get all their equipment and do all that type of stuff. And Monday was the first day of practice. And we've seen a week's worth of practice now. We're actually going to have the game in Mercedes-Benz Stadium here, I believe, this weekend. No, next weekend. Um, and you're starting to see, you know, a lot of things that we had questions about. How are they going to use this player? Where are they going to use this? How is this guy going to perform in this system? And it's really interesting because you're you're seeing some of the guys that may have been disappointments in the Dan Quinn system on defense, especially be used differently and be used in positions that may be better suited for them. I.e. like Mariner is probably a better three, four outside backer than he is the way we used him, whatever that was. And then we, uh, we got people like, um, I can't think of his name now. He is the defensive end slash D tackle. He didn't play that big white guy. Anyway, I can't remember his name. You got Marlon Rogers, who's who's showing out and really showing some of his promise that we didn't Mar- see last. Davidson. Marlon Davidson. Yeah, sorry. Um, but you know, it's it's really cool to see that now. So you know, granted, this is only the first week of camp. People are still learning. People are getting more comfortable. It's been fun to watch, though, and you're starting to see position group battles pop up. You're starting to see where areas where maybe we didn't think we had quite as much depth that we actually do, i.e. the receivers, the cornerbacks. And you're, these some of these young safeties are getting out there and making plays and looking really good and really aggressive in some of this these schemes. So I like it. There's a lot of stuff to cover in this. Uh, we, of course, won't be able to get to all of that today. But this is something that on over the next couple of weeks we will be talking about as camp goes on. Kaminsky, thank you. That's who I'm talking about, Bryce. Uh, and we'll we'll probably go position group by position group. But it's been it's fun to see, especially with, if you're someone like me who really enjoys this time of the season. Um, biggest news coming out of camp though is Calvin Ridley is fully healthy. He's just got to go through a couple of you know a couple of exams where they're going to. Keep a close eye on his foot. And the big thing is he said he's ready to be ready to be that that number one guy for the Falcons. And I fully expect him to step up and be that type of guy. Um I think we all, you know, expect that from him after what we've seen and him playing last year when Julio was out for so long. I think he's proven that he can handle that. So I don't want to get too much into that. But something I do want to get into and something that's popping up as being a possible strength on the team is one of Arthur Smith's strengths was the ability to get running backs involved in the way that they should be uh, and use them properly and take full advantage of their skill set. So what, what you've been seeing is he's been asking his running backs to get way more involved in the run, uh, the passing game out of the backfield work on their hands, get involved in this because they're going to be used frequently and you need to be able to do both in this offense. So that's probably one of, one of the key reasons we signed Mike Davis because he's a hard runner and he's got soft hands. You got Cordero Patterson who's got, you know, was naturally a receiver slash returner. Now he's in the backfield. So it's going to be really interesting. But one of the guys that's popped up here recently and frequently is Quadri Allison, he's seeing a lot of reps and he's looking pretty good. And people are actually saying he might be fighting for that number two spot behind Mike Smith or Mike. Uh, Mike Davis. Mike Davis. Smith. <laughs> Mike Smith came back. Not Mike Smith. No. Hey, <laughs> hey guys, uh, we're gonna be fast and physical. No. The Falcons aren't tough. The Falcons aren't hard. Ball spit. Oh God, and that that safari cap that he would wear. <laughs> It was so bad. I do not miss the Mike Smith era one bit. So quit it, brain. Oh, God. Those are this bad days. Winning, we're still the winningest coach in, in Falcons history. That says something, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Not really. <laughs> no, not anything good. Yeah. Right. But so with Quadri Allison, I, I mean, I kind of want to spotlight him here today. And I want to get y'all's opinions on him and – how do you think he's going to be used? What's your expectation for him? The over-under. Can he even possibly fight for that number one spot? Um, because he was a, a good young back coming out of a pit last year. Or, yeah, pit. 
And two years ago, right? Was it two years ago now? It's been. Yeah, like I think it's been. I, yeah, I think it's been. God, like it's been that long. Now. That man. Yeah, you're right. I mean, Dirk. Dirk was like Barry. You, you, you're not my. 2019. Kind of so yeah, so two drafts ago. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're perfect for the halfback dive, but I'm gonna bury you on this roster. <laughs> was so he he was here for uh, uh, Dirk's first year back, right? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So unfortunately, Marco, what do you? What do you feel Quadri can do for us? How do you feel like he can be used in this offense? What What's your vision for Quadri Allison? You know, if you're the GM, you're the head coach, how are you using this man? I mean, to me, honestly, the way that the running back position has sort of um, devolved and evolved sort of at the same time, I feel like there's no reason why we can't get, you know, a very good production, very good to great production from Quadri. Um, I don't think he's a RB one. I mean, I think that's Mike Davis. Uh, you know, not that he he's like holds it without having to work for it, but I just think he's obviously proven a lot more. Um, but I think very quickly, if if Kadri shows out this season, we could quickly be like, oh man, uh, where's this guy been? <laughs> you know right. what I mean? And I think he in the I think I know and I know and not just think I know he has the potential to really shock a lot of people from play to play. I don't know if he can string a whole season together, but we've seen explosiveness in spots where it's like, this guy has some of that it factor for a guy his size, where it's like, why don't they use him more? Right. Yeah, man, those are all fair questions because we, ex I think a lot of us had high expectations for him. Micah, what's your vision for, for Quadri? What's your expectations, et cetera? Um, I can't, I pretty much said, I thought I had high expectations for him this year. Anyway, I, of judging off of Arthur Smith and what he did in Tennessee with Derrick Henry. Now, I don't think, I don't think Kadri is exactly like Derrick Henry, but size wise, I mean, he's what, six, one, like two thirty, two uh, two thirty something. And uh, let me get the exact. He is 6'1, 232. 232. Yeah, 6'1, 232. He's a big boy. He, he's, yeah, he and he runs about a four five. So that means he gets in the open, he gets in the open field. He's gonna have a little, he's got enough burst to run away from some folks. So I think potentially. I don't. I don't know how good. I don't remember how good his hands were, though. But I think that was his weak point. Blocking yeah, we've never seen hands. We've never seen his hands. <laughs> yeah, he he could potentially be a solid number two and possibly number one. Because if if Mike Dave, Mike Davis, outside of last year, Mike Davis has had some injury issues in the past. So if Kadri has to step up and be a number one for a game or two. I think he could potentially have some put up big numbers for us and, you know, be like a Derrick Henry light to almost to say so. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. Like, I think as far as what I've seen from Arthur Smith and, you know, the, the bits that I've I've been studying a bit what he likes to do. Kadri can fit it, but he definitely needs to improve his hands 100% if he wants to be able to fit in this system because Derrick Henry, even though a lot of people think of him as just a runner, he's got pretty decent hands. Um, he's not an elite receiver. He's not going to go out there and run routes like Kamara and McCaffrey and all and like Kareem Hunt. He's not going to do that. But he can. you can trust him for a little flare out. You can trust him for a, little, a screen here and there, a little hitch route. Things like that. He's got the ability to do that for you. Mike Davis is obviously a little more versed in in the receiving game. And from what Quadri was coming out of college and what we've seen, it doesn't seem like he's that at all. So we may be, we may see the beginning of what he could do, but I think he still needs like another year of development in this system. Unless he's just been putting in work like overtime. He's like, I'm gonna be a receiving back. I need to do that. So we'll see, um, but sorry, I was being invaded by a, a toddler there for a second. No, 
But What's uh, he still doing? What's he still uh, up I don't know. It caught me off guard. It actually thought I was a ghost out of the corner of my eye. I was like, oh god. <laughs> but um, yeah, he's he needs another year, I'd say, to really fit into this system and to really do something that's like I can be a three a three down back. But he's got promise at the goal line. He's got short yardage promise because he's a big guy. He's got, and if he gets a hole, he can take it the distance because he's got really good straight line speed. Just no wiggles. Maybe that's like the a key to the you know we've been or me especially have been asking the questions like why didn't we take a, a running back? Maybe Arthur saw him you know and saw some of the things he's done on tape and it's like why we don't need to take another guy. We got this guy with fresh legs right here on our team who's giant. Like you say, uh, Derrick Henry light, you know, I can, I can make this guy something special. So maybe that's why. Yeah. I mean, that would be, that would definitely be a a pleasant surprise and something that we've been missing here for a while is that tough, that tough type of runner. We expected it to be Steven Jackson when he came in, he was, his legs were dead. We expected Todd Gurley to be able to do that. His legs were dead. You know, if we could get someone out of college and be, a tough runner that'd be that'd be great that's it's what we've been missing we've been missing that hard-nosed football since michael turner's been here and even uh i forget his name jason snelling actually did, did a pretty decent job of that spelling turner as well in the yeah. wake of all that so we need that and we absolutely have to do that uh another guy that i want to talk about before we we move on and a position group that i want to cover next week so I want to talk about Marlon Rogers and what y'all's expectations are for him. Davidson. Uh, Dave, I keep doing that. Why do I? Marlon Rogers is one of our friends. Yeah. Davidson is apparently I don't like him that much, even though <laughs> can't even remember the man's name. Marlon Davidson out of Auburn, the second round pick from last year. He plays uh, DN slash D tackle for us, and in this uh, this system, he may be you may see him on the outside coming off the edge a little bit. So he's a versatile guy. He's a bigger guy. He's about the size of. Brady, but he's got a lot more athleticism too. So you can use him all over the place. And in a Dean P system, that's that's a key piece. So I want to talk about him briefly today and then include him in the positional group that we'll be covering next week. What's as interesting you. is that most and I mean, is, is it Mo? Most are not still on the team. So they must see something in him that they like. Oh, Deidre. Deidre and Deidre Sot- yeah. Deidre and Sonat's definitely got promise, but we'll see. I mean, a lot of us, whenever he would get in that lineup, like, yeah, good play, man. And then you wouldn't see him for six more weeks. You're Practice like, what? squad. It was like, what? <laughs> we're we're carrying an extra fullback instead of Sanat? <laughs> he didn't dress? What is going on here? Yeah, Two that, punters. That just, oh, we, matter of fact, we just cut a punter. Who did we cut? Yeah. Um, What's the one we drafted last year? Yeah. Oh, the guy from... Uh, he is actually dating one of my mom's friend's daughters. Oh, so that wow. was yeah, well, yeah. We, <laughs> we South brought, Carolina. We wound up cutting him, and then we brought in um, the former UGA punter. It's weird that we're bringing in a punter. I thought Hoffrichter was pretty yeah. good. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Maybe yeah, he's not. I, as... I think he, I think he's injured. <clears throat> oh, okay, he's still hurt. Damn. Um. Yeah, let's talk about Marlon Davidson real quick. Then we're going to go to break and come back on the other side. We'll, and, we'll do the baseball for Oh, yeah, baseball. Break. Sorry, yeah, it was baseball, then break. Um, So, Marlon Rogers, God. <laughs> Golly. Boy, that name is just does not want to associate in my brain for whatever. <laughs> Marlon Davidson. I think he's got something, a special season up ahead of him for us, and... It's going to be really cool to see how we use him. Like, I'm excited for him. I know he was one of the guys that I mentioned earlier. Do you guys have anybody that you really want to see or you're excited to see on defense? Or could be a rookie, could be a guy that's just in the, the scheme change. Who are you looking forward to seeing on this defense, guys? Uh, Foyer. I'm excited to see how he looks in a in a defensive scheme that makes sense you know, because he's so smart, you know, and I think like his intelligence alone was making him be a standout. And now that he's in a, you know, I think he's going to have a a Pro Bowl season this year. Yeah. Did you see that pick he made the other day? No, I didn't see it. He was covering. Oh, yeah, yeah, I did. I did. I did. They, uh, they shared it on uh, some, some place shared it because it was his birthday. Right. 
Yeah, man, that that guy, that speed at that size just doesn't make sense. And he hawked down a ball and wrestled away from a, a running back that was running a wheel route. They'd stride for stride with him. Micah, who you got? Um, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I can't I can't pick one. Um, Dean Pease is, is very a very good uh, defense coordinator. So I'm excited about and I've heard so many good things about like the secondary, how good the secondary looks, how good, how much uh, better the pass rush looks like. You know, you talk about Marlon Davidson. I mean, <clears throat> he could potentially be like Trey Flowers was for that uh, for the Patriots back uh, a few years back. And you know, Foyer, I'm interested to see how he does. Debo, how he does in the system. Michael Walker, it's it's so many players that I'm I'm just really intrigued on how like how much diff how differently our this talent we have on defense is gonna be utilized. Yeah, there's you know, I, I know I said Marlon Davidson. The guy that I'm excited, I think, is going to have a good season. But he's not even a guy because I kind of understand how he's going to be used. But the the position groups that really introduce, inter, interest me the most is that outside linebacker, that like that 3-4 linebacker slash defensive end. That group is really intriguing to me because that's where we've been the weakest for years, obviously, mm -hmm. is that pass rush. And I want to see how he integrates – these guys that are naturally talented athletes and, you know, if put in a proper scheme could really stand out. And that's, you know, JTM, that's, you know, a lot of people aren't going to really like it, but that's uh, Dante Fowler because if any of you watched him at Florida and watched him when he was at the Jaguars for a bit and then on that, that Rams defense, he can be used across – all of the linebacker spots and you can move him and blitz him from all different types of locations. He's good enough in coverage that he can not be a liability if you have to drop him back in that, in that coverage sometimes. And I mean, he could be a real weapon for us and he could come off that list of a lot of fans are like, Oh, we should trade Fowler. He's a bust. He's a bum. All this type of stuff. No Fowler one wasn't healthy last year and two was used grossly inappropriately. Yeah. So, um, Next week, we'll get into, you know, that we'll take a deep dive into that position group on the edge rushers and do a focus on that. But uh, as far as I go and the grid splits goes, I think time has expired. I know that ran a little long. We had a lot to talk about and catch up on. One but, quick uh, thing I just want to say that is funny just because it's relevant now. Um, the Basically, you know, everybody knows Dan Quinn is now the, the defensive, the D.C. over there in Dallas. Mm -hmm. They're saying now that... <laughs> Uh, what's his name? Um, uh, KZ and um, Keanu. Why can't why can't I remember his name? Uh, number twenty two. Kiki. Keanu. Yeah, Keanu Neal. A uh, Keanu Neal. Like they're they're struggling to get on the field uh, down there in Dallas. <laughs> like apparently it's not working out for them down there. And I'm like, damn. Well, um, wait, they have because every highlight I've seen of KZ, he's making a pick. That's what that's what they're talking about on the radio. So I'm just going off with their saying. I haven't it's, I haven't been watching their their camp or anything. But some guy from the Dallas reporter or whatever came on and he was saying that they're struggling. We know a lot of these guys are full of shit. So who knows? Right. Because <laughs> he had a big pick on day day one and then almost had a pick the next day. So be interesting. But yeah, let's um let's take it out, out to the diamond there, Micah, and um, let's talk some baseball. Mm -hmm. You know what time it is? It is time for the Suicide Squeeze, the baseball segment of uh, the show. So, we got a lot to, lot to cover. Uh, actually, we don't have too much to cover. We have quite a few things to cover, though. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the MLB trade deadline uh, approached recently. Uh, there was a record number of 10 all-star caliber players uh, moved to the deadline. Uh, some of these marquee deals uh, that were made were include the Dodgers acquired both Max Scherzer and Trey Turner from the Nats for four young talented prospects to fill holes left due to injuries to both Clayton Kershaw and Dustin May. And uh, we all know why they're without uh, Trevor Bauer. Uh, so the, the Cubs also 
had their extremely massive fire sale in which they traded their top three talents in Chris Bryant to the Giants, Rizzo to the Yankees, and Javier Baez to the Mets. And, uh, you know, the Braves uh, made some necessary pickups as well. Uh, the Braves picked up uh, outfielders Adam Duvall, uh, George Soler, uh, and Eddie Rosario, as well as reliever Richard Rodriguez. But uh, there are still multiple injured players, including Rosario, who should uh, give the roster another boost in uh, next coming weeks. More, more impressively, though, the Braves are finally able to go above 500. They hit the 500 mark, y'all, and it only took 109 games. I'm taking credit for that because literally the first Braves game of the season that I watched was last night. <laughs> we, we <won>. After <laughs> after going eight and nine for the first 17 games after the All-Star break and sitting one game below 500, we finally broke that mark. Wasn't it so. a historic, like, win, loss, win, loss? Win? Wasn't it like that had never been done before? Like a team, like, win, lose, win, lose so many games in a row? Bro, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's necessarily the stat, but, yeah, goodness. It was, crazy. It was 11 in a row. It was win, loss, win, loss, win, loss, win, loss, win, loss. It was crazy. All right. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, fortunately, but, you know, fortunately – we weren't too far out of the the race the race for the division because uh, two of the teams, two of our three, uh, two of our rivals decided to have big fire sales as well. Like I talked about, uh, the Nats trade traded away Scherzer and Trey Turner, two of their best players, away for some prospects. Um, also, the Marlins traded away um, Starling Marte, who. Now, granted, I mean, they, they didn't have much of a choice because they had already pissed him off to the point where he wanted to get out of Miami because, you know, the Marlins are screw-ups, and that's all they do is piss, pe- uh, piss people off, uh, e- including their own fan base. Um, so, so yeah, so they uh, – but the Mets have, have been uh, on a skid as, as of late. The Miami Marlins was taking care of business – Against the the Mets and I, I believe the did the, the, the Phillies win tonight. Yep, the Phillies are now the division leaders, and we are one game out of first place. Okay, <laughs> so thank you, Phillies. You gave us a shot, and we we'll, we will overcome. We'll overtake you. So um, yeah, we're coming for that division soon, sir. Uh, oh, and uh, last but not least. Uh, our catcher Travis Darno began his uh, rehab assignment uh, in triple uh, in Triple A Gwinnett last Friday. The team announced. So the veteran uh, the veteran backstop was expected to begin his rehab assignment this weekend as he works as he works to return from his thumb injury. Darno has been out since early May, and. Um, yeah, so he was hitting 220 with two home runs, 11 RBIs, and before his injury, and the Braves. Were, but the Braves have seriously struggled to replace him, as we've seen uh, between Stephen Vogt and uh, Kevin Kevin Smith, who Kevin Smith couldn't hit his way out of a paper bag. Um, you know, if he fell out of water, if he fell off a boat, he probably couldn't hit water. He's batting like a buck sixty. Uh, I mean, good God, I could. You know, come out there and match that. Probably, <laughs> I haven't played baseball in years, and I can at least make as much contact as he is right now. Um, yeah, but uh, I mean, other than that, that's uh, that's all the major major news as far as Braves and baseball talk. So that concludes the suicide squeeze. All I know is we better not see the Dodgers bring Trevor Bauer back for, for the playoffs or anything crazy like that. Tre- Trevor Bauer, Trevor Bauer needs to worry about more than just getting back for the playoffs. You need to worry about. Uh, he might get off with this thing. Uh, I mean, he could, but goodness, that that's still a, ugh, that's an ugly situation. 
muted. Uh, you're muted. muted, sir. Yep, I am muted. Um, let's take a quick break, and we'll come out on the other side, do a little special segment with Bryce, do some college football, then we will wrap it all up with the NBA. So thanks for sticking around. I know it's getting late, and we'll see you on the other side. USA, USA, USA.
What's up? Welcome back from the break. Thanks for sticking around. As you notice, I'm sure it is no longer three of us. There are now four of us. We have multiplied. And this is what our the person looks like when you combine all of us and squish us all into one person. This is the Fish and Grits uh, science project. This is Bryce. Not you're not on. You're you're a part of Fish and Grits. You are a part of the Fish and Grits family. I I get you're you're coming on for a debut segment. Look, it's like it's like it's like that Spider Man meme when Bryce and Micah start arguing. It's like they're like, I'm like, y'all two are just literally trying to troll each other back and forth, and it's. C E. Um, yeah, Bryce also runs our TikTok, gives us uh gives us assignments essentially. He's like, hey, look, you need to make a video of this. It's funny as a 16-year-old is like, you guys, you guys need to do these videos. And it's like, well, he's more tapped into these things than us. It's produced some pretty good content. That one that <clears throat> if you don't follow us on TikTok, TikTok, go ahead and do it. Tic Tac, my mouth and brain today. Just it's like Ooh. follow us on the them Tic Tacs. Them kids and their Tic Tacs. It's weird. I never liked them things anyway. Um. <laughs> but yeah, follow us on TikTok. Uh, also follow us on Instagram, Twitter. We need to get more active on there. That's my fault. Uh, but we're really... Ooh, roast. So, uh, uh f the we're gonna span the gamut. We're gonna go the gamut of all the conferences and good teams, bad teams, and in between teams. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Who wants the bat lead off on this?
I mean, it, it'd be crazy to think that you're not going to gain an advantage by playing for a, a school that plays in the SEC and is a big team you know, that gets a lot of national national attention. You're on ABC a lot. You're in the NBC games a lot. You're you're at the 8, 8, 8 p.m. slot a lot. I mean, those type of teams and those type of players are going to get way more and I mean way more endorsement deals than just like, say, Georgia Tech will. Like Georgia Tech's going to be able to get some, but what they're not going to be able to do is compete with the likes of Georgia or you know Clemson or Alabama or, hell, Notre Dame. Being that they're independent, they're on, they're on NBC all the time, they're going to have such an advantage on getting these kids' endorsements. It's, it's really crazy. Like, there's going to have to be some type of national regulation. Congress is probably going to have to step in and draft a bill that, that evens this out. It, because the way that the NCAA has, has gone about this, so just whatever. It's not our, our thing. Let the conferences handle it. It's just, it's ugly. And it's really, you know, it's what the NCAA, NCAA does with everything. They don't have a, a governing body. There is no one one entity that rules and makes rules and you know sets these regulations. They leave it up to conferences and they just go from there. And, but they're the ones that are benefiting from all this. So they really need to step step it up, and they've got to do a better job with this because otherwise, the 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 competition gap is going to be way worse than it is now. It's already pretty bad. You can pretty much always bet on the top 10 being about the same unless the school falls off here and there. But if it, if this is going to be executed this way, it's going to be a lot worse. You're going to have like four teams that are in the run running for it every year. And that's about it. Right, real quick.
Yes. Uh, at quarterback, Mackenzie Milton, hands down. He's got the most experience. He's got the most talent. He's got the ability to step in and really take over an offense that's been lacking a leader for the past. God, really? I mean, really since Jameis left, in all honesty. Like, DeAndre Francois was supposed to be that guy, but never was. Um, James Blackman was awful. We We've tried to... We tried to throw a lot of guys in there the last couple of years and really not not too much fault of their own because for those of y'all that haven't kept up, Jimbo Fisher really left the cupboards bare in a lot of important positions and really screwed us over in a lot of ways. So, you know, you're putting these guys back there in new offenses that they weren't recruited to play in and behind an offensive line that was really, really really bad like historically bad in some areas and expect them to to succeed and it just hasn't been that now now that the offensive line is starting to come together and you've got a more competent head coach as far as offensively and taking control and weeding out some of that stuff mckenzie milton without a shadow of a doubt in my mind gives us the best option to win those games where we have to throw the ball because Travis just isn't it. Um, he's a great option quarterback. He's a great gadget guy. But accuracy and throwing and knowing how to dissect the defense just isn't his strong suit. He's got a cannon, though. Um... You know, I was looking at our schedule the other day because I haven't really taken a hard look at it. And with the way Norvell is turning things around, and I fully expect the offense to be a whole lot better than it was, but we still don't have the elite weapons yet, and the offensive line is getting better, but it's not to where our standards used to be. I could see us going anywhere from a... Seven win team at like our lowest and at our absolute best, probably being a 10 win team. Um, that's if everything comes together. Um, there's still some question marks on a very talented defense, but how are they going to be used? Are they going to play up to the potential? Because that's always the questions, you know, in, in these programs like Florida State, where you get a guy who's not going to be the, you know, surefire first first round pick at cornerback or at linebacker or at defensive end like an Alabama or a Georgia does, or, you know, a Clemson does nowadays um, or Ohio state does. I mean, that's just not the guys, the type of guys that are coming there. You get guys that are, yeah, he was a pretty good guy. He has the potential. Like if he really puts his nose down to the, to it and works hard, he could be really good, but not. So I'd say, yeah, it's between seven and 10 wins. Mm, two areas, I'd say. Well, no, three. Um, offensive line is the biggest worry because it's been our problem the last couple of years. The ability to generate a pass rush has been really bad. And then also now, it's who's going to be that guy at wide receiver now that we've lost so much talent, um, now that Tamori and Terry's gone. There's some good guys there, but... It just really depends. Like, you know, Ontario Wilson looked really good in the times that we he stepped up, but then he also looked really bad. Uh, our other guy is, um, what's his name? Uh, Keyshawn Helton. That's his name. Also, you know, a good athletic guy, but can he put it all together? So it just really depends. Were they, were they products of having Travis throw him the ball or were they, you know, were they just not as good? So we'll see. Um, that's the that's the, the least of my worries, but I'd say the the two lines for sure.
Yeah, throwing a freshman in Alabama. Uh, real quick, Marco. Apparently, Derek King has been recovering exceptionally well from this injury, and he's way ahead of schedule. He said he's confident he'll make it to camp. September 9th, I believe, is the first, fourth. Yeah, I think 9th is our first game. Who are your two losses?
That's crazy. Yeah. No, nah, you got it. Go for it. I'm going to go, I'm going to go Bama one, just cause they're, they're so stacked. Like I don't see anyone beating them this season, honestly. And then I'm going to go Georgia out the East. Cause I think the East is a lot weaker this year. Uh, you guys got a lot of good pieces despite, you know, losing some secondary guys. Then I'm going to go. I don't trust Oklahoma. I just don't. I never, never will. Um, I don't think Clemson's going to be good, good enough. But like DJ Uyunglele, he's good, but let's see how good he really is. Especially if like Justin Ross doesn't come back. Um, I'm going to go with a surprise team in North Carolina. Sam. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And 
at number four, I don't know if I really want to go three SEC teams, but like Texas A&M, I think they could easily come out of the West this year. Uh, or at least right. Yeah, I don't, I'm trying to make sense of that in my head as well. They, they could go like 12 and two or like, I mean, I'll throw Ohio State in there just because they get their receivers are stacked. They're they've got um those two they've got two wide receivers that their names are escaping me right now that could well Ohio State's offensive line is ridiculous, at like absolutely ridiculous, and they've got two guys. Uh, on the receiver core that could easily be first round picks or even top 10 picks. Uh, let me get there. Yeah, I mean, they're, yeah, Wilson Garrett. Let's see. Let me get their quarterback because I always forget. They always have some guy that just pops in. CJ Stroud. Not even going to lie. I don't know who that guy is. Uh, but I hope Bryce has been freezing every now and then. But um, Bryce is being f- <laughs> eaten by the Matrix right now. No one, no one can hear you, Bryce. Literally, and he's gone black. Quick, put more water in the water wheel. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we can hear you, Neo. Come out of the Matrix, bro. He must have... Do you speak fax machine? Oh, you're you're the boss. You mute it. You mute him. Oh man. Oh. That was fun. I did enjoy talking college football because we don't get to talk about it much and it just typically doesn't fit in with all those. Let's go. Izzy. Maybe. We'll see. Wrap, yeah, go for it. Uh, wrap up your segment. Oh, God. Get him out of here, Mikey. Ah. Oh, Jesus, that was brutal. Let's turn that guy off. Get uh, everyone's filters back up. (laughs) These guys. Right, this Yeah.
literally. Evan, Evan Fournier steps it up and brings it home. Um, it You know, a gold medal is always a gold medal. And that's in the history books, it's never going to be, you know, 30 years from now, they're not going to look back on this. And, no, too much. Yeah, like Kevin Durant's going to literally be able to be like, look, I scored the most points for Team USA ever over time. I've, you know, I've got two or three gold medals now. Doesn't matter. But, um, like, oh man, I, I feel like y'all were cut off there for a second, but, um, it's going to be, it's going to, we're, it's going to be gold, but it's not going to feel like an impressive one. That's the best way I can feel about this. Like, there's a reason the narrative about this team is what it is. There's a reason because the people who are watching the games and looking at it are saying, this is not what it's supposed to be. If you look at the talent that's on that floor, this is not what it's supposed to be. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I mean, it's a gold, but at the same time, he said, look at all the, the names. Like, we're, we got so many guys who were superstar and, you know, all-star, like perennial all-star caliber guys, maybe not su quite superstar, but perennial all-star type guys on this roster. And it, like, it's disappointing. Like, when, when we look back at the, with the 08, um, oh, like, with the 08, the dream team, teams like that, bruh, it wasn't even close. Most of these teams, it was like, all right, we beat them by 30. Easy, light work, let's go. And with all of these names, you're supposed to be beating some of these teams like that. The fact that we legitimately played a game and Evan Fournier outscored three of our biggest names play, named players on our team, it lets you know that it's like, bro, what, what are we doing? Like, you know, like, do y'all take this seriously or, you know, the – do you have like pride? What <laughs> do you have pride trying? You got to, pride, Willie. <laughs> went, went, like for the country, it's just like, bro. I, I just think I think we should have been. Like I said, like Ryan said, as many name big names as we have on this team, it should have it. It's not impressive as impressive as it should have been. Yeah, I agree with both of y'all sentiment. That just like whether we hold on. By the way, they cut it to six. Uh, whether we hold on to this or not, it's just like this team definitely won't go down in infamy. It's not even like it doesn't even appear to be. I almost feel like that team in 2004 that came up short would probably win gold this year, like by a lot. <laughs> it's like that team with AI, LeBron and all them. But it's like, yeah, this is just sort of an underwhelming performance and and not an underwhelming squad talent wise just performance and and that the question you rose is a good one um micah maybe these guys just aren't that proud to be american anymore maybe that's like you know before it used to be like a really big deal a lot of you know i don't know if they meant it or not but a lot of guys would say that winning that gold medal was the, one of the best feelings of their lives and you know what i mean and they really like look forward to it. maybe they just don't feel that anymore so I don't know, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't want to blame the style of basketball too much, but I know that has something to do with it. But at the end of the day, it's like, these are supposed to be the best players in the world. They are, they're not just supposed to be, they are the best players in the world. And their, their performance, this Olympics has not shown that at all. Well, we, we also, we also went to the positionless style of play where like the fact we didn't even, we didn't pick a traditional point guard period. Right. Like a guy who legitimately is a, more of a distributor than just a shooter, a scorer. It was just like, all right, we'll just outscore everybody. 
but you've got Coach Pop as a coach who's not really an offensive minded coach. He's more of a defensive minded coach. So, right. Like, so hey, I, Draymond, go out there and tell him what to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when when Draymond is your best ball handler, <laughs> suspect. Yeah. Hey, you want to hear some fantastic news, Marco? What's that? For whatever reason, the stream cut off the audio for all of Bryce's segment. It did? Yeah. Oh, no man. audio. Well, you could hear me, but couldn't hear any of y'all. Well, for those of you, join us on the, the Spotify version. You'll be able to hear the whole segment. That's true. Yeah. So at what point did it come back? Uh, a couple of minutes ago. Okay, so did they? It's okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I see it here. All right, well, that sucks. Well, well, next week we'll make up for that. But anyway, um, so moving on, um, there have been a myriad of moves in the NBA that have shocked a lot of people, um, particularly with three teams, the Lakers, the Heat, and the Bulls. Um, the Lakers made a trade for the best statistical point guard in NBA history, Russell Westbrook, uh, shipping coups, Harrell, and some other pieces to the Wiz, and um, have also brought in some early 2010 stars like Carmelo and Dwight, um, as well as some promising guards like Nunn and Monk. Um, the Heat have added Kyle Lowry, paid Butler some big money, and also acquired P.J. Tucker. Glue guy. Wow. <laughs> glue guy. It was like, that's a team full of glue guys. <laughs> <laughs> like who's gonna score <laughs> anyway um the bulls have gotten the most busy however by adding lonzo ball and demar Derozan to their already offensively talented roster um other moves in the league can include Kemba to the knicks uh dinwiddie to the wizards patty mill to the nets um also kd and Kawhi have both agreed to re-up with their respective teams so um with all these moves in mind uh, which of these sort of impressed you the most and which team do you think might uh, have benefited the most in terms of, you know, the win going up next season from their aggressiveness in this uh, short period of time in free agency so far? Oh, um, this is tough, though, because with every good move, I see some bad moves. Like every, so like, for for example, the Lakers, uh, I think them picking up Nunn, Monk, and bringing in Dwight was huge for them. But I also feel that Russell Westbrook can't co coexist with LeBron. They, their games are too similar. They, and so, um, as well as Melo, Carmelo, I mean, like there was a reason you didn't, LeBron didn't want to play with him in, when he was in Cleveland. It was just like, oh, we can make this trade, but nah, <laughs> nah, we're good. We're good. You stay in New York, buddy. Um, so the Heat, like you said, now I, I probably like the Heat moves more than anybody just because of that just sheer toughness, that, uh, the grit and toughness that they have. But like you said, it's still a problem scoring um unless tyler hero just all of a sudden figures out what he left off in the bubble i right. don't know if that's gonna happen <laughs> hero but, bubble. yeah uh then then yeah they're gonna they're gonna struggle they don't legitimately have anybody who's just a pure scorer on their roster now they did sign duncan robinson but he's still he's not, he's a, not a shot <laughs> he's not a shot creator he's he needs he's a role player up. yeah uh, the Bulls, I like, I like uh, Lonzo, but I don't like Demar Derozan. It's just like mm. yeah. it's like they Man. wanted Kawhi, yeah. and they settled for De Derozan. <laughs> Man, if that's the case, you could have just traded Indianapolis. You could have got what's Costco Kawhi from Indianapolis? <laughs> T.J. Warren, <laughs> good old Costco Kawhi, aka T.J. Warren. You could have got him from out of Indiana. Indiana. Uh, <laughs> Kemper to the Knicks. It, I when when I heard about that one, uh, my my friend who's a Knicks fan posted that in one of our group chats, and so I had to use uh, the Jadakiss 
quote from the uh from the versus battle that <laughs> it's good, but it's not enough. <laughs> By the way, that versus battle was classic. That's the right. best one I've ever seen. That was amazing. Oh, yeah. It was the perfect I, I set of people to go against. It was. Yeah, yeah, it was. It, it was a slaughterhouse. <laughs> it was. It was. But it was entertaining. An entertaining slaughterhouse. It really was. Did, like, oh, but like I said, Dinwiddie to the Wizards. I I like that one. But Kuzma to the Wizards. <laughs> Bradley Bill is just Bradley Bill is doing everything in his power. Like, I just please just let me go somewhere. <laughs> right. They took Westbrook, but not me. <laughs> Kuzma, Kuzma's like, what's up, Bradley? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I don't want to play with that guy. <laughs> Didn't even respond. Didn't even like his post. <laughs> right. <laughs> so ignored. Yeah. So I mean, there are there are some um, wait, KD. Oh, 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 oh okay. No, no, the, the way you put it in there, I was like, wait, he's with the Clippers. KD and Kawhi are teaming up. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But not nah, like, yeah. Uh, other than that, I think the Clippers stood pat, but they have, they have flaws with the way they're, they're built anyway. So, like I said, probably probably the best moves overall, in my opinion, were uh, the Wizards, honestly, because I just I'm just not a huge Kuzma fan. But you got Trestle, you got um, Dinwiddie, and it hopefully if you can keep Bill and keep Bill happy, that that it could be potentially and um, <clears throat> Lonzo to the Lonzo to the Bulls, I thought was a really good really good pickup so um you know it's been a, a super interesting free agency and there's been a lot of moves that i do like um i'm gonna say the lakers just because i just want to see like that's the one i'm most interested in because it could go one of two ways and those two ways are on Polar opposites of the spectrum. Mm-hmm. It could be spectacular, and this this marriage could be one of the best ones ever because you got all these guys and they're they're inspired because, like LeBron's post said, they're everyone's counting them out because their age and you know people. Think but he deleted because he knew that was ridiculous because no one ever counts out LeBron ever. No, but I mean there there has been stark stark opinion stark. Starkly different opinions is what I'm trying to say on social media about what people think it is. Because some people are like, oh, it's a super team. And then some people are like, well, they're just super old. So we'll see. Um, <laughs> Los Angeles AARPs. <laughs> right. So, I mean, they're all so talented and so just otherworldly athletic that it, 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 you know they could come in and really win 65 games and not a lot of people would think too different of that. But at the same time, they could also come out and win 41 games. And it's just like, oh, why did we put Russell Westbrook and (laughs) and LeBron and Carmelo and Dwight all on the same team? What were were we thinking? Might as well just bring in JaVale too. And you know what? We're going to go. Who's another good one? I don't know. But yeah, just another guy that's just like not, never lived up to quite what they should have right leaving lebron out of that of course um Bella. yeah well to to be perfectly honest with you i think they got the wrong player out of out of washington if yeah. you do that if you make that trade for bradley bill this i honestly in my opinion would would definitely especially with all the other moves they made it would have been the the best moves in there but you get another ball dominant point guard who plays almost identical to LeBron and it's just like all right so how does that work how With do you a much lower IQ <laughs> yeah oh yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean maybe LeBron is exactly what Westbrook, what Westbrook is that needed yeah like it's like look bro chill right that's the only guy I feel like Westbrook will listen to Willie though <laughs> or that will talk to him because Katie was afraid to even talk to him he just made faces and Bradley Beal wasn't about to tell Westbrook about shit. So 
<laughs> uh, real quick, I did see a stat that was KD's best year scoring, Harden's best year scoring, and uh, PG's best year scoring ever. They all played next to Westbrook. Really? It was the years with Westbrook. Those were their best years ever at scoring. So. Yeah, but they were all willing to play off ball. Let let well, well, let, let Harden didn't really play off ball. Yeah, well, I mean sometimes, but but let let Russ come down and make a stupid mistake. See how fast LeBron takes his ball right, his right. ball handling privileges away. No, I mean, you stand it, in the corner. Westbrook will have to slow down, you know, his, his with LeBron on the court because LeBron ain't about that running shit no more. <laughs> like that's just no. not. The Lakers have one of the slowest paces in the league, so. Um, you know, with AD, also AD's not about to be running up and down the court like that, so he'll have to slow down. So, like, like Ryan said, I think that is probably like it's the most intriguing one. And and I hate that LeBron brought Melo and Westbrook because those are two of the guys I want to see get championships the most. But it's like, oh, that means that he's gonna get in that goat conversation again. It's like, oh man. But well, I do want to see those two win um, championships. Someone brought up now. a good point that these are two guys that KD couldn't win with. And he's trying to prove him wrong on both of those guys. I'm talking about Katie's trying to prove those two wrong. Yeah. Or Westbrook's trying West, to prove no, Katie wrong. LeBron's trying to prove KD. You know, oh, he's okay. that much better than KD. Yeah, they, I saw some some uh, meme or whatever you call it call it these days, <laughs> where it was like all of Westbrook's teammates that he's played with, and they're like, if Westbrook can't do it this time, we got to look at Westbrook. <laughs> I mean, honestly, <laughs> like, I've been saying that forever, but I guess I'm, they finally now. Wait, which which two guys were? It's watched? just Westbrook. As soon as I said, that, I was like, wait, no. Oh, it was yeah, they. Yeah. They included Carmelo in that conversation. Oh, okay, yeah. right. But yeah, Westbrook's played with so much talent in his career that, and he has never won anything. But um, the other one, Chicago made a lot of moves. But the interesting thing about those moves is that, um, Lonzo and Demar Derozan are sort of like. Not to like, you know, mental health is a big thing these days, but those guys are sort of mentally compromised, I feel. So it, it it's really gonna be it's really gonna ride on if if they can disprove what people already think about them. Because DeMar DeRozan's already come out as being sort of, you know, was he depressed and suicidal and all these kind of thoughts. And and now there's gonna be a lot more pressure on him. So it's like, you know what I mean? I could see them sort of don't I think they'll make the playoffs, but I could see them sort of underperforming what people think they'll do. Um Wizards will probably be an eight seed again or something like that. Um in that play in tournament again. I actually and, uh, really like the moves that Chicago made. Like really like I them. do too, but it's like I just there were first of all, who's gonna play defense? I know Pat Williams Lonzo. is a great a great defender. Lonzo's a great defender. Other than that, they don't have a defender out there. DeMar uh, doesn't play. I think anything. they'll probably trade Laurie Markinen pretty soon here for somebody. Yeah. So, so they're gonna they're gonna need to shore up their defense. Or is he he, did just, he sign somewhere else? Because Lonzo, first of all, Lonzo's always hurt. Lonzo always gets hurt. Right. So you, you're counting on Lonzo and Pat Williams, who's a second year guy, to lock down. You know, I mean, it, it, I can see it working, but they're still gonna struggle defensively. And um, you know, I think they'll probably be six, six, five through six, seven seed. Um, but yeah, like you said, Lakers, I think made the best ones. Patty Mills is also a great pickup for the, um, yes. for the Nets. Like he's a great real point guard. Unlike, you know, Kyrie Irving, but James Harden's obviously the real point guard of that team. But, uh, so anyway, moving on Hawks talk, Hawks talk. Hawks talk. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> So um, the Hawks have re-upped Trey Young and John Collins to a potential $330 million over the next five years. Um, luckily, we didn't go on on Tuesday because I may have said some ugly things regarding John Collins. Uh, perceived The media had perceived that he was sort of holding out on what everybody with common sense was like, John, this is a great deal for you, bro. <laughs> like, Because I was going to pull up the numbers and see all the players who were making that. Because Chris Paul just led his team to the finals and is getting this same money. And John Collins, you did not really lead us anywhere. Even though you helped, you were not the leader of the team. But um, but luckily, that didn't happen. Um, so we already know what the expectations are on Trey, um, just to be incredible and amazing and elevate all his teammates. 
But what kind of things do you think, do you need to see from John Collins on this $25 million a year um, pay raise? Ryan, go for it. What's up? I'm going to say do exactly what he does now, but be more assertive with it. He's going to have to, in those moments where the shooting's gone cold and the, you know, the, we're getting bullied down in the paint on boards. So he's got to get more aggressive. In all honesty, he's going to have to demand that, that ball on the low post because he's an excellent, excellent post offensive, uh, offensive threat. He, he's got a ton of mid po- mid range post game. He's got a lot of low post game. He's really effective down there because he elevates so quick. So I want to see that more. I want to see him, you know, continue to shoot around 40% from three. Uh, maybe take 50 more of those this year because he's he's pretty effective. And he's got to, got to, got to, got to, got to get better with the ball in his hands when he's out at the perimeter. He can't just be a catch and pass type of guy or like a catch and one dribble set of screen. Like, or catch and travel. Yeah, like it's just that can't be you. At that height, there's too many guys that, is you, that are your height and weight in the NBA and can fly up and down the court with the ball in their hands. It's just inexcusable at this point. Like it, with, if, at his athleticism, he should be able to become an elite wing threat. Uh, yeah, so I agree with the, a lot of what you said, especially the the last part about, you know, he, he basically he needs to be a little more versatile because, you know, as the second, supposed to, as the person who's supposed to be the second best player on the team, especially offensively, you need to have more in your bag than just a, a – three that has to be set up by somebody else and a post turnaround fadeaway. I mean, you, you gotta, you know, <clears throat> I need to see maybe a baseline spin. I need to, I, and really I need to see him put on some, some muscle um, because way too many times Philly playoffs in general, like he gets the ball in the post, he get bumped too hard and then just kind of oh, lose control of the ball. It's like, no dude, you can't, I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's Joel Embiid and big old this big old out of shape looking self, and and you know he bumps you if he leans on you. You you can't drop the ball. You you got to be able to hold your own against guys like that. And I mean, um, he he actually improved he proved a lot on defense um, from where he was in the past. But I, I just really my biggest thing was. I got to see him get stronger because, you know, I last thing I want to see is him get bullied down on the paint. And like I said, he's, he's so – he can score inside, he can score out, but need more versatility, get one or two more post moves, and I need you to get a little more strength. And then I think you'll be <clears throat> more of what we're, what we're looking for, what we need, more of a physical. Because, like, Bobby Portis – shouldn't be outplaying you at all. I'm just saying. There's a reason Bobby Portis is a backup in your right. starter. PJ so, Tucker and Bobby Portis are ex- boxing ex- you out and ex- out rebounding exactly. you. Exactly. Uh, breaking news. Uh, uh, the United States has just won the gold medal. Uh, hey. 87 to 82. Yeah. They held them off. Close um, game against France. <laughs> yeah. France is a talented team, though. I mean, they yeah. had Rudy, Rudy and uh, – what's his name? They have three Batum and Fournier okay. and four four NBA players. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <the dude laughs> uh, Thibel, Matisse Thibel. Um, we all right. So every single body, every single person you named on that is pretty much a bench player bench or player. a role player. <laughs> we got all these superstars <laughs> and we beat them by five. Right? Yeah. I mean, like That's, we said, <laughs> underwhelming. <laughs> This is one of the most unconvincing gold medals ever. That'd be like an NBA team going up against Kentucky and University of Kentucky and winning by like seven. And it's like, oh, well, yeah. You, <laughs> going you, against uh, Steph uh, Marbury's Shanghai Sharks. <laughs> <laughs> winning, by, winning by five. <laughs> like, what? 
<laughs> is stuff that good shit <laughs> but um so oh, yeah man, I got it <laughs> <laughs> i feel like ryan said the key word of what i need to see from john collins aggressiveness mm-hmm. and i, I want to see aggressiveness and now that they're paying him like a star i want to see confidence slow down like every time he catches the ball he's always trying to make something happen so quick because I, I don't think he has confidence in his face-up game I don't think he has confidence in putting the ball on the floor when defenders are all up on him, especially when it gets tight in the post. And he always, he, he does it. They only call it sometimes, but he always does that stuff where he ca- he catches it right at the free throw line. And then he takes like two steps and travels it before he gets into his move. Yeah. It's like, he needs to stop doing stuff like that. Just slow down, like slow down, work on your back to the basket moves. I like his, his turnaround hooks. I like some, but I need to see some up and unders. I need to see some, I don't necessarily want him to necessarily work on his handle or anything like that. Cause I think that might distract. Did you just fall asleep? Mike? <laughs> mm-hmm. He definitely does not at all. But, um, uh, I want to see him work on some of those things like under like his post moves, his, his up and unders and things like that. So that he doesn't, cause there's just so I, I can't have a guy making $25 million a year like three or four times scoring in single digits in a playoff run. I can't have that. So aggressiveness, confidence, that's what I need to see from John Collins. Um, the next thing, uh, moving on, the draft, the draft took place last week, um, late last week, and we got two promising players that are pretty rough around the edges, um, not two guys who can really come in and make immediate impacts, but pretty talented guys. Um, so what are y'all's uh, quick opinions on point guard Sharif Cooper from uh, Auburn and util- the positionless utility guy, Jalen Johnson from Duke? Uh, I'll go. Um, I'm actually more excited for our second round pick and Sharif Cooper than I am Jalen. Like Sharif's got a lot of promise. In him. and He's almost like having a Trey Young light. And the way he plays the game, he's definitely not as good of a shooter as Trey. But the way he pushes the 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 tempo for it, he puts pressure on the defenders, and he's very smart with his passing, like very very smart with his passing. He he could be, you know, he's not the same guy, but he could play that same type of role as like a Leandro Barbosa did for those Golden State teams, where he just gets out against those, you know second unit teams or tired leg first defenders or first team guys and just really run at them and put some pressure on them and force teams because he's fast. He can get out there and he can move. And he's a hometown guy. So that's always a key thing. Um, Jalen's got a lot of work to do. A lot of work. He's one of those guys where we're probably looking at him as like, maybe he'll be a potential running mate for, for OO. You know, like Kongru needs someone out there that can – be a little more versatile because a offensive repertoire is very limited right now, but uh, he has the potential to be very good. Um, I'm just not sure. I think actually I heard when we got him, the guy that was during the draft compared him to possibly Boris Jow. So Jow, yeah. He's a little more athletic than Boris Diaz. Yeah, he is for sure. But I mean, Boris was actually more athletic than people thought too, though. All right, right. He just got that heavy base, so it didn't seem that right. Way. But like, uh, yeah. So I like I was I was thinking the same thing Ryan was. I'm more excited about Sharif Cooper, um, the second round pick, because uh, Sharif is a absolute talent he is he said it's fast i mean like i said there, there's a reason him and trey are like the only point guards to average 20 and 8 as a as true freshman so you know i think it i think i really did like that pick and it fell to us um jalen i had i had some questions about um, the only the only thing that really truly made like I, I, I thought he you know decent talents like but you know I figured like all right what's exactly his role gonna be because he's a little too slow um, he's a little too slow for like you know 
small four shooting guard type. I mean, he can play some like he reminded me. I I forgot the comparison. I, I initially saw it. I'm like, all right, yeah. So, but the only upside about Jalen Johnson that I really liked was um, that was the guy that the Knicks really wanted. <laughs> So it's like, ha, stole him again. <laughs> so, yeah, other than that, I mean, it's like, yeah, he's got some work to do. Uh, hopefully, you know, he can figure it out. So he's not he, he's not like a bust or a G League uh, two-way guy. Make, like, make sure I don't want him to be like another Bruno Fernando where he's just completely lost on the floor at all times. But, you know, I, yeah, I, I hope he's a, a lot better than that. Yeah, I agree with you. I think Sharif Cooper might be our, you know, immediately be one of our better backup point guard options. Uh, I think he's better than Skyler. Uh, you know, he'll get more minutes than Skyler has gotten, even though Skyler, not no disrespect to Skyler, I think Skyler's pretty talented. Um, but um, as for Jalen Johnson, I mean, I watched a good amount of Duke games, and he's not really great at anything. You know, he's just an athlete. He got a lot of putbacks, a lot of alley-oops, a lot of things like that. That's why when they, we picked him, I almost thought, is this like a sign that John is, you know, yeah. going elsewhere? Uh, thought the same um, thing. Yeah. So, you know, maybe if if he gets his, you know, experience up, he'll be a good energy guy off the bench, you know, to come in and grab some rebounds and, you know, get some putbacks and things like that. But like you said, maybe he can help that second team with a little more versatility. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, I think I wanted uh, Mamu, the the big center who ended up on Indiana. Indiana gets all the big skilled white guys. <laughs> he's so good. Um, but he fell, he fell way far. So yeah, he's, we'll he's very good. Out. Sharif yeah. fell too, because at the beginning of the year, people thought Sharif could have been a lottery pick. Right, well, well, averaging twenty eight. I wonder what made him fall. Like, what what about his combine made him fall? Size, so and he's just not as athletic as people. Like, he's slight of frame, like Trey. Okay, okay. Well, speaking, uh, speaking of guys who fell, this next guy we're talking about was the same way. Okay, so in other news, uh, Lou Will, Lou Will, Will uh, Lemon Pepper Lou has been re-upped with um, the team to one-year, $5 million deals. I know he was looking for that $10 million. He said he's never gotten a $10 million deal in his career, and I feel bad for him for that, but it's not going to happen now. So, um, uh, and we also have news that, I don't know if we talked about this already, but Kongu is slated to miss nearly half of the year um, with a shoulder surgery. Um, so with this in mind and the moves that the other teams have made, what are your way too early predictions on where we will place in the East next season? Third. We're going to finish third. Yeah. I, I, I strongly feel that too. Yeah, I agree. With Nate the whole season, health on our side, I think that, you know, we'll edge out a lot. Like, I think we got Boston. I think we're better than Chicago. I think we can score more than Miami and we'll lock at all positions. Uh, we're Philly. We edged out Philly. Um, so it's going to be Nets, Bucks, and then us. We we were the deepest team in basketball last year, and we just got deeper. Right. We didn't lose anybody or anybody of importance, I should say. And we just got deeper. Like what, Tony um, Snell? Tony Snell. <laughs> Sharif, Sharif He's Cooper a blazer was, now. Sharif Cooper was pick, pick 40. 43. 42, yeah, 43? 43. Yeah, because, nah, it's it, funny to me because um, I remember Lou Will was the number one high school player coming out that year, and they thought he was going to be a lottery pick. He dropped to 45, pick mm -hmm. 45. So, and, and that's why I was, like, making a comparison to Sharif Cooper because undersized guard, you know, extremely talented and then wind up right. dropping. Not an amazing athlete, but a mm -hmm. bucket. Well, uh, Lou was Lou was an um, beast coming out of high school. Yeah, in high school he had hops. Like he was dunking yeah. on everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so, His teammate yeah. was better than him. Yeah, Mike Mercer. Crazy. Yeah. It's crazy how that works out. Like some players, uh, well, like Lenny Cook. Everybody's like Lenny Cook's better than LeBron. <laughs> See how that turns out. But um, 
so that's pretty much it for the layup, aka the finger roll, aka jelly time, aka points in the paint. Burr, burr, burr. <laughs> um, hopefully we get those those videos up soon here. It'd be nice to have those and use them. Um, yeah, that pretty much does it for us. I know that ran really late because we started late because of technical difficulties and just a plethora of other things. And I know there's parts of this segment that there was no audio for some reason. It's just, it was a rough night tonight, guys. <laughs> but if you, we, we were off for almost two weeks and then also technology just wasn't cooperating tonight. So I hope, you know, for those of y'all who stuck around this long, we appreciate you. We'll we'll get it together and hopefully it runs smoother here on Monday when we are actually interviewing Josh Brooks, the athletic director for UGA. Uh, he will be going live with us at 4 p.m. We have him for one hour. So we have the athletic director for a Power 5 conference top potential, you know, college football program for an hour. So we'll be posting ads for that probably tomorrow, Sunday, and then Monday as well. Um, we will be doing, uh, we've already collected some questions from fans, but if you want to get on a live stream, uh, we will be doing this live so you can ask him questions. There will be a segment at the end where we will set aside some times for questions from fans. So um, tune in for that. That's going live at four o'clock. The questions will probably start around 445-ish. I would, I would guesstimate. But um, we are Fish and Grits. We appreciate you guys. We're going to get out of here and figure out why our computers hate us and do better next time. Appreciate y'all watching and peace. Peace. And if you like fish and grits and all that sports shit, everybody, let me hear you say, oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh, yay.